Hello and welcome to Physics Office Hours. My name is Eric. This is a conversation that took place over on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash physicsoh with Simon Clark, PhD in climate physics and a science communicator here on YouTube. You can check out all of his links in the description below. In this interview, we talked about everything from climate physics to life to science communication and even played a game with Twitch chat at the end in GeoGuessr. If you're interested in learning about physics live, please feel free to stop by my Twitch channel. I stream every Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. The schedule is down in the description. Without further ado, here's the conversation. For today though, today is the, today is the, the, the today is the day of, of today. So that's important. Um, and <laughs> this yeah, is I think it's Carl Sagan that said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, famous <laughs> quote, definitely. Um, and uh, so, what's today going to look like? So, Simon and I will have a conversation. Uh, we'll, we'll, we have a couple things that we want to talk about: some physics, some science communication. Simon uh, just finished writing a new book. That's kind of a big deal. So, <laughs> we have some stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, after that, uh, we'll do some uh, Q and A, some formal Q and A. So, if you have a question from now until Q and A, then you can ask it the following way: type exclamation mark, ask, put a space, and then your question, and then it will go to a separate holding tank where I can look at it, uh, and uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, <clears throat> and I ask that you ask one at a time because I can't, it, I have to move them over manually one at a time, so you can't ask more than one; it will just get lost in chat, and uh, if it's lost in chat, it's lost to everything. So. Um, Exclamation mark ask, followed by your question, and then uh, during our dedicated Q&A, we'll handle some of those. No, it's not an ask-a-thon, just so you all know. We will not. <laughs> I've heard about this. <laughs> we will not. It's going to be very timed, very timed, very timed and ending. Uh, and then after we do the Q&A, uh, Simon and I are going to take you on in a game of GeoGuessr. So, uh, you guys know that sometimes on, on my channel, we like to, I like to play you in, in various games. And uh, today, the game is GeoGuessr, and I need a little help because, as you know, I'm not very good. So It's, it's you against dozens, hundreds of people. And so. they, they're all over. The, I mean, I literally had one of my mods go, hey, I've seen that sign before. She lives in South <laughs> Africa. It's not fair. It's not I fair. Actually, I, I watched a video of a guy who was a London cab driver doing GeoGuessr in London, and he was within like three meters on every single guess. Oh. And that was with barely moving the camera as well. It was Is one it Geo Wizard? Things. No, no, no. It was a guy, it was like something, the taxi driver or something. It oh, was wow. a guy, an actual London cabbie who was just like, you know, he could just look at a street and be like, yeah, that's definitely city. That's Fleet Street at oh, the end there. Oh, man. It's like, oh, so impressive. How, how, how do we do that? Anyway, so, uh, so that's what today's going to look like. Uh, so, you know, stick around, uh, get some questions ready. And hopefully we'll have a good conversation. So, uh, firstly, um, Simon, you you've had a you've had a very successful YouTube vlog career, but I'm wondering about before then. So, what was your what was your uh, early education like in in like elementary school or pri primary? Is that was primary? Yeah, UK is primary school. Um, yeah, I mean, I was I was very much the the, the science kid. In, in school, like I was always interested in that kind of thing. I mean, to be fair, I was kind of the annoying kid who was kind of interested in everything, which is something that has definitely bled over to now. Um, but I, <laughs> it was one of those, um, uh, we did, I think it was for SATs when we did like our standardized tests at the end of primary school. And they were showing us like a video of, you know, what's the way around? Does the planet, does the planets orbit the sun like this? Or does the, the sun orbit the planets? And like everybody kind of like looking at me like to, to see what <laughs> like what I said and I was like guy how do you this is very easy <laughs> like so I feel like I was the science kid amongst potentially not like the most sciencey cohort um but yeah like I was I was very interested in in science from a young age although the first thing I used to want to be was a paleontologist I um was oh paleontologist in, yeah I used to really love dinosaurs and I, I think I went a little bit beyond the classic um, you know, I watched Jurassic Park and bought every piece of merchandise with a T-Rex on. <laughs> like I was actually, you know, I, I watched because uh, we had walking in dinosaurs. Sorry, walking with dinosaurs here in the UK. 
and um i had like all of the they had like collectible they weren't really toys it was like a scale model of a dinosaur with like all the facts about it and i had a fossil drawer uh, i was like labeling the stuff that i found i also thought that do you know what do you know what a, cro a coprolite is no mm -mm. um so if, oh hang on am i getting that right i think a coprolite was the stone that um certain dinosaurs would swallow in order to um uh, oh no, gastrolith. That's a coprolite is fossilized dinosaur poo. A, a gastrolith Naturally. is what certain dinosaurs would swallow in order to help with their digestion. But I used to think that I had a collection of gastroliths because they're, because they're these very, very smooth stones. Of course, I didn't realize that I was collecting them at the beach and that like every pebble there was naturally smoothed by the ocean. So <laughs> <laughs> I just had a bunch of oh, pebbles. No. You were duped. Uh, um, but yeah, like so that was my my initial interest, and then like um, when I went to secondary school, I kind of yeah, I, got, I guess I got more and more interested in science. Partly because it was kind of easy. Like I just I'm sure that you must have had this as well. Like you, you everybody to a certain extent follows the path of least resistance. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And science, I, there was a really uh, like a moment I clearly remember in physics class when uh, they asked a question. We were talking about energy. And uh, my physics teacher was asking, why is it more difficult to push something up a hill against the same resistance? And I didn't know, so I just guessed, because you're having to convert your kinetic energy into potential energy? And they're like, <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember clearly thinking, this is easy. <laughs> the physics thing is easy. Um, and so, yeah, like, I guess I just followed it, followed it from there straight through to <laughs> the university. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. I had, uh, I was, I didn't really have a thing, right? Like a, 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 I, I didn't really have like a thing that I enjoyed. I liked math when I was young, young, like really young. Uh, but then I didn't do anything until high school. In fact, everything was tanking. Like my grades were tanking terrible. And uh, I remember that I was, I failed off the soccer team one time. So if you get a blow a certain grade, you couldn't play soccer. Like you just couldn't oh, wow. play. It. So like I, uh, I failed off one year and then the second year I was, uh, my chemistry teacher said that I earned a 63, which was failing, but she was willing to give me a 64 if I made the agreement to start like paying attention and doing well. So I was just like, I felt like terrified of her. So I was like, okay, yes, please. <laughs> like, don't, don't ruin my, <laughs> my college, you know, my soccer year. And, uh, and then after that, I started paying attention it turned out that it, that, you know, it, math and physics were actually interesting and that's what I wanted to do. And then like, then I, so I did really well on everything for like a year. And then I kind of threw everything else away and just sort of kept the math and physics and went really hard <laughs> on the math and physics. And that's all I, that's all I interested in. See, but, I never really enjoyed maths at school. It was one of these, I never really, <clears throat> until kind of midway through university, really, like made this realization that actually they're kind of two faces of the same coin, or rather like physics is just applied maths. Right. But right. at school, I just did not enjoy it. I had a great teacher, and if it wasn't for her, I would not have got the results I did and would not have gone to uni to do physics. But I just didn't didn't find it interesting at the time. Which I, <laughs> I see the before chat gets angry at me, like I, I see the error of my ways. <laughs> I am now a big, like, you know, evangelical <laughs> maths person. So don't, don't hate me, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I I uh I wonder about what type of math you use in in your like in your uh well when did you start researching climate physics was that an so undergraduate that, so the way that it worked at um Oxford was you did in the fourth you basically you didn't choose any courses um well you know in the UK obviously you don't do majors and minors you just choose a subject that you study so I did three years of just maths and physics um and everybody did the same courses and then in fourth year um I, uh, you could choose two major options, which became your master's focus. Um, and one of them was atmospheric physics for me. Uh, well, atmospheric, oceanic, and planetary physics, I think it was. Um, so I started then, but I think the, the moment that I decided to do that was the previous year when we did a course on fluid flows. And um, I just, something really clicked in me. Of, I really like, I liked the physics of describing a continuum uh as opposed to like point particles that you know you'd basically just do up until that point when right 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 any kind of mechanics really to finally actually have an equation that's oh this is how the fluid at a particular location is flowing and that's within a uh, continuum 
that and, and then combining that with thermal physics of you know you're applying this amount of energy in the form of radiation with to a material with this heat capacity um and you know how that changes like the gradient and so it changes the viscosity and all that kind of stuff um and yeah that just really hooked me in and, and, and in fact i had a, a similar feeling recently i've been i've been studying some um qft recently yeah i and, saw that i saw that yeah yeah and, and like getting to the point where you take the infinitesimal sorry the continuum limit of like uh weakly connected masses mm -hmm. and you start treating that as a field it was that same that same kind of feeling of oh this is really cool you know that's that same kind of thing that hooked me but but yeah originally it was third year and then going into fourth year is when i started doing the uh, atmospheric specifically stuff cool um yeah i didn't know that they did that i didn't know you took like three years of the exact same the exact same classes how big were those classes then if everybody was taking so, the same so thing? the cohort at oxford for me was we started out with about ooh, 180 people i think for physics and then we had a really brutal um I, we had a really brutal first year a third of the of the year failed uh and uh i was one of them i had to reset um and did did really well i was just off the first in uh the reset but um yeah like a lot of people it was noticeable that we were we, we, we were fitting into smaller and smaller lecture theaters <laughs> like all the first year lectures were in like the biggest lecture theater and then it was the next biggest one and then by the time it was like the fourth year theory option because that when you actually got to choose then the class sizes were way smaller yeah, yeah. but you'd have like I think there were 30 people in the physics, like the theoretical physics major option and about the same for the, the other, which was the other major option I did. And then, yeah, like 30 people for the atmospheric one. Wow. Uh, yeah, so quite big classes, but then it's, it's you know, the, the Oxbridge system is you have um, lectures and labs on a large scale across the whole university, but then you do problem sets every week that you're tutored by um an academic and that's one to one or two to one kind of thing so it's okay. gonna be me and somebody else sitting down with one of our tutors and going through the problems um a couple of times a week so it's this mix of like you are in these big classes but you also have these very sort of small intimate kind of tutorials who, who are the tutors were they graduate students or uh, some of them were grad students doing, uh, well, they're not PhDs because Oxford likes to be special. Uh, they're called DPhil students. Uh, uh, but uh, a lot of them were lecturers or professors. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Like sometimes <laughs> there was the, the the occasion where I was taught atomic physics uh, in third year. And I was being taught by the guy who wrote the textbook on it, uh, which was like definitely not <laughs> normal. Like, you know, you sit down right, in the yeah. tutorial and he'd be like asking you these questions and you're like, oh <laughs> you know this then, so much better than me then you like dread like you dread the fact that you found a typo in it and you're like i don't know how to <laughs> like... how to break this to you <laughs> oh we had one guy it was james binney who did the it was the year no no it was my year when he he was he was teaching quantum the introductory quantum course binney. and that's and a, he's yeah james binney he's written a book hasn't he yeah yeah so he he had this textbook but he said like yeah don't do it like it is in the book because there's a mistake in the book <laughs> and i'm just you know copy what i'm doing on the board and then he did it exactly as he had the book and he also at other lectures was like there's probably a factor of two that's gone missing in here or there's a factor of h bar that's gone missing i don't yeah. know <laughs> like, that's that's typical in particle physics though it's like you can spend any given amount of time looking for minus signs twos yeah. factors of twos eyes this is the dimensional thing set everything to one you're, you're know. like we, you know base have, speed is one <laughs> we even have an emote for that we're just it's natural units. oh really everything's natural units all the way down <laughs> um because <clears throat> that's yeah. something that like in atmos and what well, geoscience in general you just don't really do like even in the more sort of uh, kind of abstract mathematical stuff like wave theory when you're talking about bre breaking planetary waves in the middle atmosphere like you still have full kind of dimensionality in there normally it's just i don't, I don't know why it's just a it's kind of a weird quirk i guess i don't know that's it's interesting um <clears throat> we got a little <laughs> we went a little all over the place with that one let's go oh, back that, a little that was bit. question one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> huh? um i guess like i want to take a step back and kind of wonder like what what was it that uh kind of led you into the physics path at oxford then was it like something that was like stuck out to you especially since you only get like one chance there's not like a year of was it like when you started yeah. did you have to say like hey i want i i want to do physics and math at the beginning or could you do like a year of just like these are general courses take a little of this little of that and then pick something 
So you do um, your like 16 qualification, which are GCSEs, and you do, I did 11. And then you choose two, uh, you have a two year qualification where you do anything from three to five. Um, and I, I did well, kind of five. Um, and those are your kind of like introductory courses, um, which, uh, you know, for me was maths, further maths, physics, geography, and then I did an extended, what's called an extended project where you write an essay that's, I think at that time it was like 10,000 words and I've shrunk it since, um, but I did mine on uh, mad missions to Mars. Um, so that's like how you did, you, that's how you worked out what you wanted to do. And then you apply for a physics degree or a maths degree or whatever it may be. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do physics because I, I, I just, yeah, I think I had this moment in, the GCSE courses where they divide science. Previously, it's just you have a science class and then, then mm -hmm. they divide it into physics, maths, sorry, physics, chemistry, biology. And I just, you know, I was looking through the timetable and I was like, oh, all the cool stuff is in physics. So I guess that's what I want to study. <laughs> Like, True. you know, all the chemistry <laughs> stuff and the biology stuff is like, that's eh, fine. But like, there's planets and, and shit in, in physics, you know. I'm going to so, take that. I'm going to take that sound bite from you and just be like, all the cool things are in physics. And then that's it. It's that's true. It. It's, I'm it's, just gonna... I mean, the, the older I get, the more I see the usefulness of other fields, I think. Like, yeah, I've been reading same, the same. Um, the Emperor of All Maladies uh, about cancer and all the stuff to do with like molecular genetics in that. I was I had this <laughs> really pretentious moment in retrospect where I, I've been reading that and I went out for a walk in the woods near here and I was like looking at a leaf and I was like man that's like imagining all the proteins that are going on in here and all like the you know how the, your DNA is communicating to the cell and I was like this must just like such an idiot <laughs> <laughs> He's staring at a leaf but um yeah so like I I, I did all those I did the, like those uh, preliminary courses and then applied to physics courses in uh, what Oxford. Manchester, Durham, Leeds, and Warwick, and then uh, was chosen to go to Oxford. And then, yeah, like you start your first year is kind of bringing everybody up to speed with um, maths. So you do sort of uh, everybody will learn new stuff, but there'll be some people who will, have, I don't know, like learned about complex numbers in their spare time at, in secondary school. Uh, and, you know, there'll be some people who would have done vector calculus before type, type thing. Um, and um, yeah, and then yeah, you're just straight in the deep end, really. You know, you, you do. I think in first year it's like six, like major options that would be like classical mechanics, electromagnetism, and then two of them were specifically maths based. It was like linear algebra, and I think one was like vector calculus or something like that. So it's yeah, it's it's like a, it's very different to the American system. The, yeah. the only equivalent oh, yeah. one would be. Um, <laughs> like Cambridge, where you do natural sciences, where you start off with, you're doing a science degree, uh -huh. and then you specialize as the years go on to increasingly like, uh, I was only gonna say myopic, like kind of increasingly like, you know, focus in on exactly what you want to do, um, which kind of, which in retrospect should have appealed to me. And for some reason it didn't, I guess, I, I think at the time I was like, I want to do physics. I don't want to worry yeah. about all these other- Well, there's like a, there's a, there's a, uh, a fear of getting behind you know, if you don't follow the like the straightest path. So like there's yeah. in, in our in our, like it, uh, I guess in my university, I should be a little more specific. It's they don't really advise you to take a ton of of uh, hyper hyper intensive core classes like right away. Like I have I teach engineers like I teach mm -hmm. the engineering physics and uh in that engineering physics they're almost all engineers there's a lot of like computer science or whatnot but most of them aren't taking like dedicated engineering classes they have like a taste of it you know they take like a taste of an engineering class uh where there'll be like a seminar like a one credit seminar where they just like give them like one hour to keep them interested in engineering for the year you know and then <laughs> the next the next uh the next you know second third year they'll start to get more and more dedicated classes towards that and i think it's the same way for physics like i had to take like a, uh i had to take like a like a journal writing class where i had to specifically do a lot of writing and it hmm. could and like there's no physics class that does journal right there's no math class that does that yeah. but at the same time like i didn't take a single lab class that's tr that's I, wow. I didn't no i had my introductory labs like the introductory physics labs and then after that, there's three more lab classes. Uh, and we, I just skipped. <laughs> I was like, I, cause I, so I went to school later. Like I went back to school when I was older. Um, and I had the, uh, and I like didn't want to spend as, you know, more time doing it. So they have what's called a, 
uh, a, a mathematical physics degree where you could just substitute uh, okay. out laboratories for math classes. And We're I was being like, rated by biologists, by the way. I will not stand for this. <laughs> Doc, good to see you. I was, I was giving him a hard time earlier. He had a, a nice picture of um, you know, some biology thing, and it just looked like yeah, a face. Yeah. It just looked like a face. So I just went in and I started telling him about I liked his face. <laughs> and by the way, by the way, Doctor WD Forty, it's a pony. It's not a goat. Okay, we draw ponies around here. Um. <clears throat> anyways, what is this? Why are they? Ra oh my. Anyways, um, and also Farsight, <laughs> uh, he's come, I, I'm not sure if Farsight's one of your regular viewers, yeah. but he's come over and gifted a bunch of subs. Thank you so much, Farsight. I see. Thank you for the Prime and the five gifted. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and there's so many follows. I'm not gonna be able to keep up with everything today, but thank you so much, uh, for everybody for uh, the support and uh, and if you are a Doctor B40, uh, my guest today is Doctor Simon Clark. He is a uh, climate physics PhD, not even student anymore. It's not even yeah. a PhD student. It's just PhD. And uh, he makes uh, YouTube videos on all sorts of good stuff. A lot of good information about climate physics and uh, the general state of the climate. So uh, go give him a follow. Uh, exclamation mark Simon for all of that good info. Um, there is a video coming out tomorrow, I think. I've been, I've been doing one that's a little different uh, on sort of the discovery of there was one factor that kind of contributed to the discovery of climate change, which a lot of people don't seem to be aware of. So that's... nice. That blender model you made, that was like an integration oh. of the, of your code. That was really good. That looks I'm really so looking clean. Forward to using that. that looks so yeah. clean. I like that. It a does lot. take a while. Like there was a time when I tweaked the settings, but originally it was taking a minute to render each frame. <laughs> and in that video, there was a time lapse as well. So I had like 8,000 frames. Right, right. I remember when you sit, I don't know if you've ever had this with code, but like you sit down and you're like, work out how long it's going to take to finish. And you're like, oh, I'm going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> this this program is going to finish in like 800 years. Oh, and then man. you go in and tweak like one thing and like you, you vectorize one operation and then you're like, oh, this is totally fine. Like it takes five minutes. When I did a, when I was an undergraduate, I did a lot. I did some coding in Mathematica. That counts, and it was like factoring uh, polynomials. Mm -hmm. So I like had this nice, like uh, kind of like a, bi a binomial coefficient expansion that would write out this really long polynomial. And mm -hmm. they were diagonalizing matrices, right? So this was a characteristic polynomial for like the determinant of a matrix. But like these matrices were like ten thousand by ten thousand. So like the uh, characteristic polynomial was like the eigenvalues of that, right? <laughs> so then I would hit like you know enter, and I'd be sitting there waiting, and then like I'd get up and and come back an hour, and nothing. I'd come back and yeah. you know I leave it overnight come back nothing i'm like okay so maybe i should make it smaller <laughs> i learned early in the phd with coding that you definitely include progress bars because like the number of times when i've had this fear of i've canceled a program and it was probably like 99 percent of the way done it's like the um <laughs> the earth being the calculator in the of, uh hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy like it's destroyed five minutes before it finishes but also like you could have left it for a week and it's gone 0.1 percent of the way so how was that bars, people. <laughs> so how was that coding and uh doing your vlogs like at the same time because to me like you said like i you know i watched uh, quite a bit actually uh to be honest, I had uh, you were one of the main reasons I went to graduate school. So like I had this weird thing of being older, right, and also being confused about graduate school, and there was not information to find. Like especially not for someone who's not the traditional. Like I had, I was already married. I had three kids at the time, uh, and I didn't know what to even expect, you know. And then yeah. I found your I found your vlog. And, um, the, you know, that was huge. Cause then it would be like, now I get to see what it's like every day. And, you know, that was, that was interesting, but I always kind of wondered like, cause I was still an undergraduate at the time. I always wondered like how it was balancing your code versus, uh, balancing your code versus trying to do things like render video, edit stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think what I really got over the PhD was a real lack of appreciation for sleep. Um, I look back on some of the, the like how, how much time I would spend on a typical work day and it was far more than was probably healthy. Um, but, but I mean, also like I had a certain separation, I think of PhD stuff and video stuff. Like I obviously, you know, you're filming your day and your week or whatever it may be. Um, but I would not edit apart from in my bedroom at home and I wouldn't do PhD work at home. Like that was, I would leave the house and go to a library or, you know, go to campus or to my office or, or whatever to to work on 
you know, whether it was writing up or writing code or whatever it may be. But yeah, like videos were very much like a home time kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, it, it, it was kind of more, more separated than like my life and my work are now. Let's put it like that. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I and see. also, and also, like as people, as Samwise is saying in the chat, like that's such a pre-COVID thing to be able to do. Like, <laughs> I don't know yeah. how I would have coped with trying to do everything all out of my the tiny house that I was in an Exeter. So. Yeah, this whole like my whole project on Twitch started because of COVID. Like, I I would not have started on Twitch if COVID didn't happen. Like, as I just mm -hmm. would not have done it. So then, uh, my like some of the things I do on here is to learn my for myself because like I'm trying to learn you know, math for my research. So like sometimes we'll be like, I mean, the very first discussion series that we did was path integration. And it wasn't because I was really good at path integration. It was not, <laughs> it was not that. It was because I needed to go through everything again from the beginning. And I d felt like if I had motivation to do it for a, for a group of people, then I'd be motivated yeah. to do it, period, you know? It so. held yourself accountable. And I, I feel like that's one of the reasons that I kept doing YouTube, even though it was so much work was because it was especially seeing as my research group was me a guy that we didn't talk very much at all um and who lived away from he lived at home away from the uni and our professor who was the head of department and that was it so like I, there wasn't exactly much of a, d a direct kind of peer group that would understand what i was getting at with my work so i think actually how yeah making videos so people knew like oh you said you were going to be when 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 you supposed to finish this chapter by now kind of kind of thing was like definitely one of the reasons i think why i kept i kept doing videos it's just not necessarily a healthy reason but it's, you know <laughs> a reason but well I'm i just I, yeah. i'm so happy to see like you you streaming because i just i feel like twitch is this as somebody who has done youtube for so long twitch is far more exciting to me there's the, the capability to do have real time interactions with people who are watching your streams to learn is super super valuable for, yeah. to them as an educational experience but also to you as a teaching experience like definitely you get feedback in real time about what you're doing well and not doing well mm -hmm. um but also the thing the reason that i kind of wanted to do the phd series on youtube in the first place was i think it contextualizes the scientific process it, it means that science isn't this abstract thing it's a thing done by people so it's you know something that when you watch a youtube like, like you you, you know you did like going to grad school is this kind of monolithic topic that seems impenetrable but if you yeah. just watch somebody go about their day it's like oh that's how you do it you know it's, yeah. it's 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 contextualizing the process of grad school and i feel like with with twitch you can contextualize the process of doing science by just being a person on the internet right and also you know if you do the other stuff like play video games or whatever other streams you want to do like people get to know you as a person and you are a person that does science which yeah. I, I just I think is really underestimated for how valuable it is to how people perceive science and how uh, it's not reserved for a certain class of person, you know, like it's not for people who are up on the pedestal of academic grades. It's like if you can follow the process in a stream, you can follow the process of science. True. Yeah. Like I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to. Like I was lucky, I guess, is the fact that I could go back to school at a later age right mm. and i wanted there was a little bit of time a couple months that i didn't know if i would be able to so i tried to learn some stuff on my own but there was no like there was no interaction it was like you watch some lecture on youtube and like if you have a question you can ask like in the dreaded comment section like, oh, you know? don't wait down there <laughs> <laughs> or you could just email like an inbox that won't be looked at you know so it's like there was a lot of i i really longed for some of that interaction and then I, you know, had the chance to go back. And I really do consider myself lucky for that. And I know that there's people who don't get that chance. So, like, there's that's another reason why it's, like, nice to have something interactive on Twitch where, like, someone could show up and be like, you know, I wish I could go to school, but I can't. So I'm trying to learn mm -hmm. on my own, and I'm just stuck, like, on this concept. Plus, like, the the, uh, the culture on Twitch is just so lovely. Like, can, you, you, if you gave me the choice between YouTube comment section and Twitch chat, <laughs> I am throwing oh, myself no. head first, Ralph Wiggum style, <laughs> into Twitch chat. Like, the, it's just no comparison. Yeah. You know, people will, who have questions are legitimately responded to. You know, yeah. people who, uh, certainly when you've done it for a while, like we have, you know, you get, 
you, you get a community of people who know this stuff better than you probably do. Yeah, yeah. Like, and so when you have a question, you can ask them. And when other people in the community have questions, they they ask each other. And it's just, I am, it, it's obviously I don't actually have kids. You do, so you're better, you know, equipped to answer this. But I, it, it's almost like being proud of like your children, of like <laughs> yeah. you know this wonderful community of people who support each other. And when you see them being awesome yeah. to each other, it's like yeah. You, you guys are great. I, aren't I great for pulling you guys all together? <laughs> uh, so Koopsie asks, would you recommend others do that as and try to teach topics you aren't confident on to an audience and learn on the way? What do you think about that? So that was that's kind of what I do with um, the climate coding videos that I do on Wednesdays. Normally I do on Wednesdays. Although, I, admittedly, I have actually taken a couple of weeks off now to try and um, learn about some of the topics off camera because I felt I think I was feeling a bit self-conscious about um uh, it was ex we basically reached a point where i was like i have such a gap in my knowledge here that i need to go and away and learn this before i can do this on a stream so i think you you can do it and i guess you could argue that's kind of what a lot of twitch is it's people will watch people play video games that they know very well yeah um especially if they watch something that's story driven like say i don't know last of us or uncharted or something um they watch to see other people learn how to do the thing that they already know how to do and they, they they take pleasure from that process so i think that people that's kind of how a lot of people use twitch anyway really so you know if you think it would be useful um and you're at that wonderful place where you're so confident in your abilities because you don't know how little you know like that's the sweet spot to start twitch streaming i think because then you'll be pushed into the the, the pit of despair of i now realize how little i know and then yeah. twitch chat you build up the momentum will push you up the slope towards oh i actually know a fair bit about this and i can be pretty confident that i know a fair bit about this but yeah i, th I think other people can do it. it's not something i'd recommend everybody does because i think you do have yeah. to have a relatively thick skin to do it a hundred percent mistakes yeah. out there but i think i personally think it's a, a useful way to to, to learn Right. And then the goal, I think the, I think the idea is like, I always treated it more like a reading group where like everybody knew the book we were going through. A lot of them had, a lot of my you know viewers had the book or mm -hmm. I could find a PDF of the book easily type deal. And then I didn't feel like it was something where, and I always make my notes available ahead of time. Right. So it was always like something where I didn't feel like it was you know, a requirement of me to teach them much as it was just uh, Hey, this is what I found. And then like they, th of course it's not, it's a little more one-sided cause I'm the one with the camera and the Twitch channel and yeah, everything like yeah. that, you know, but it's not like uh, but I didn't feel that. I didn't feel that way. So it was much more open for me to make mistakes because like, if I did make a mistake, then someone who knows more about it would just be like, you made a mistake. And then I'd be like, Oh, okay. <laughs> like let's try yeah, to figure yeah. out what that mistake is. So I don't make it again, but it was a lot less like a, a lecturer style, you know, where it's like, yeah, it's, it's putting yourself in that uh, research group kind of, you're just around the table. Yeah. You are yeah. not up on a lectern type thing. And I feel like if you go into it with that mindset, you're going to have so much of a better time of it. Because I think if you're up at the lectern, you you know, you know, start sweating because you realize, oh, I don't know this as well as I think I should. And they're going to realize that. Whereas if you're in a, a, in a group meeting, for example, the whole point is to share knowledge, which is a two-way street. And as you say, it's, it's not exactly egalitarian because you are the one in control of the big button that says end stream. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think you, uh, the closer you can get to that, the more rewarding it is. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> like, do what do you think about the way that tw the uh, education is, is taking place on Twitch? Or let me rephrase that. What do you think of the way that Twitch is responding to the education uh, that's taking place on Twitch? Because yeah, it's so certainly, like, this year has been the, the year of education on Twitch, like... This is For when sure. it really started to take off. Yeah, which I'm, which I'm really glad to see. And when I've met with people from Twitch uh, at events, they have been really excited by the idea of people using Twitch for educational content. Um, you know, they are 100% behind it. In terms of how much material benefit people like us have necessarily seen from Twitch, um, I mean, how much preferential treatment can they give any one group of people? Really. Right. Um, right. Like, it, it'll be great if they did like an event where it's like, you know, here's a hundred people who are, te who are teaching on Twitch right now. And that was like on the front page. That would be great. Sure. Um, and hasn't happened yet. And I feel like if they are really serious about it, then maybe, you know, that would be, I, I feel like it would only reflect well on them. Right. You know, I mean, admittedly, would I want my stream to be on the front page of Twitch at any point? Because that's like 
eight thousand. It's like the battle for Helm's Deep taking place in my <laughs> comments. Like I, I don't know if I necessarily would want that, but I do feel like they could elevate the profile a little bit because actually, yeah. yeah, you're totally right. Like the pandemic has transformed the way that people do stuff on Twitch. Kind of, and it's not just education, obviously. You know that there has been this move away from um, uh, just gaming to stuff like art and cooking and the strange trend recently of people in swimming pools, which I don't know if you've seen any of these. <laughs> yes. but like, you can't avoid it. No yes. matter how many times you say, do not recommend this to me, they just keep yeah. recommending other ones to you. And it's like, <laughs> what does this don't recommend this button do besides just recommend another one of the same thing? <laughs> like, like what, are you, what are the thousands of people who are watching this? What do they get from this? I <laughs> like, don't know. Anyway. But yeah, like it has, and it has, it, the, the, the landscape has changed pretty significantly, I think. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and as some people are saying in chat, there's the science and technology category. Mm -hmm. But I think if Twitch was serious about, we are a platform that is more than just gaming, yeah. they could be doing more to, to push sure. that. Sure. I think that if they just did that, like just did this, the fact that they can move away from only gaming then it would be better for educational community without like necessarily highlighting the educational community. If they just went away from, and like, there's this weird thing now where you're getting recommended lots of hot tub streams and things like that. But like, they're not recommending the, the streams that are like, you know, even like travel or cooking. Like there's, there's mm -hmm. actually been lately a lot of cooking streams, which are, are good getting like the front page and getting the um, highlighted and things yeah. like that. But, um, but like if they but, just but, but moved away, it also comes down to the way that people use Twitch, because yeah. certainly for me, I view Twitch as I'm working and I'd like something and I'm sick of listening to music. I'm going to put something off in the background. Same, same. Uh, or if there's like an event stream, like um, Wednesday evenings, uh, Tom and Ben from the Oxcast play Total War Warhammer. And that's like a, a uh, it's almost like your TV show being on at a certain time. Like you try and tune in and if you miss it, you catch up on demand. But like, you know, I think... Most people don't come to Twitch looking for challenging content unless it's one of those like event pieces that is every time at this week and I'm going to come to be part of this. So, you know, I feel like, um, you know, that perception of the platform kind of needs to change and the reason that people come to Twitch, which, and when that happens, that's I think when you're really going to see that explosion in educational content. Um, because certainly as an online educator, it's kind of the, the lowest barrier for entry and also the easiest way to monetize your time if you wanted to do this as a business. Like, you know, it's this or online tutoring, basically. And yeah, I personally would much rather do this than online tutoring because it's free at point of use. It's entirely, you know, discretionary, um, which is the way I think education kind of should be. Um, but yeah, like I feel, I feel like it's the perception of Twitch as being an easily consumed platform that needs to change before you see really significant changes in how like Twitch engages with the educational community. Right. Agreed. Um. <clears throat> yeah. I. I. Uh, I. Uh, sorry. B BMP is just distracting me. <laughs> Boring math professor. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on. Uh, it's just, anyways, I can't get over him. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> I wanted to know. Now you went to Oxford. I wanted to know if there was anyone who was like very influential there that was also kind of like you know one of like the hyper famous physicists who you had ex interactions with and whatnot who was very influential. Oh God. Uh, very I, mean, I bumped into I bumped into Andrew Wiles on the street. Okay. Um. Well, I remember like he was waiting at a at, like a zebra crossing, like a road crossing, and uh -huh. being like, "Be cool, just be cool." <laughs> Don't. He probably doesn't want you to talk to him, and you know, just like being, you know, just like seeing him around like a normal dude was was pretty fun. Um, in the physics department, uh, I guess the probably the most famous person would probably be James Binney, because he won like the Dirac Medal and some other stuff. Like, admittedly, it's not the, it, if you were going to like the most famous, the place where all the famous physicists are in the UK is probably Cambridge, like mm -hmm. uh, Damped, people like Martin Rees and, and, and stuff like that. Um, or possibly I'm just not aware of the people who are famous, you know, in their respective fields. There was, there was, there is actually a very famous guy in atmospheric science uh, called Miles Allen, who's at Oxford. Um, 
and you know I got taught a short course by him and you know had chats with him outside of that that class which was pretty you know he's the kind of guy who's got several nature papers and you know all of that on um uh, like distributed computing and and climate and, and stuff like that but yeah there aren't really that many famous a-listers I guess that that's not the um <laughs> that's that that wasn't the question I was expecting you to ask I thought you were going to ask like people being like classically Oxbridge assholes because oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. there is definitely a, a reputation for that <laughs> no although I see that the chat's going a little nuts on that but no no <laughs> um the uh no I just wondered who influenced you like did you okay so more broadly than who influenced you maybe even in the science communication realm I mean was there anybody who influenced you in that realm well, certainly, um, like the best lecture I ever had was on thermodynamics from Stephen Blundell, uh, and I still think about that lecture. Like Stephen Blundell. Stephen, oh wait, Stephen Blundell. Yeah, have you the, got beef the with author. Him? Uh, yeah. not no, not beef. It's not beef. It's I've had a few textbook ish, textbook issues with him, and a couple of them have cost me some grades. Um, oh really? Yeah, like he has a lot of errors in his books. And uh, he, as he, pr as he pr uh, produces like high, like higher editions, they start to go away. But there was one, uh, my statistical mechanics class, the, uh, the teacher, he wrote the book uh, with his wife and uh, I believe, and um, it was uh, the, my teacher used the book for the first time and he gave us a P he said, you can get it through the library, but it's a PDF, but it's an older edition. And he said, but it's okay. So the I use the older edition. I got like five or six questions wrong in like a span of like two homeworks, all because he corrected errors in the questions and they were <laughs> reworded like differently because they were like he was asking for something differently in one of the questions or something. And uh, so I was kind of bitter. And then uh, and then uh, there's another famous particle physics book for uh, introduction. Oh, what's it? I recommended it to one of my mods here. He gets bitter about that. Um, but it's it's a really good book. Lancaster and Blundell are the authors. And it's a really good uh, introductory book. But I told my advisor that I had issues with finding errors in one of Blundell's books before. So then he goes, okay, well, I'll be careful about that. So he was doing one of the calculations that was relevant for our research out of Lancaster and Blundell, just kind of like for fun. And he found a big error in it. <laughs> and then we went through the errata and everything. There was no adjustment for the error and everything like that. I was like, should we email them? And he was just like, nah, he's just like, let's just shelf the book for a little bit. And I was like, okay. Oh, wow. But I like the book. The book is great for conceptual. I think it's called, um, quantum uh quantum field theory for the gifted amateur or something along those lines that's what people are saying in chat yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. uh oh there it is quantum field th yeah very good thanks justin and uh yeah so they uh it's a great book for conceptual learning but there are some we did find a couple errors in some of the in some of the calculations which would throw someone off you know oh, if wow they were doing something but. i seem i mean i seem to remember something about this now you mention it because we, we used to do as tutorial problems like some of the questions from the back of the book i think i remember that but yeah, he he was he was so like he a big taught influence. you he taught you yeah. stat thermo. Uh, he he did the thermodynamics course, which was thermal basics of thermal physics, statistical mechanics, and uh, kinetic theory of gases. Did you use his um, book? Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> which I think is a great book. I, th I, I think um, the the uh, he was was he he was history heavy kind of right. Yeah, he had biographies at the end of each chapter, which I was like very, that. which was influential on me in writing um, the book. Actually, like trying to trying to incorporate history into science. Like I always, it, I find the process of how this stuff was discovered and the stories behind it was dis how it's discovered far more interesting sometimes than the yeah. actual yeah. subject matter. But it was him and his wife. They both wrote the book, yeah. and his wife uh, taught the special relativity introductory course in first year okay. and i've told this story on my stream before but she shushed us like we were, we were <laughs> like a class of kindergarten like we she we, that somebody was talking in the audience and then like she turned around and shushed a lecture theater and i remember everyone being like there was like that silent is she for real <laughs> kind of reaction um but you yeah, know he was oh, he was no. great he um he, he, his lectures were like the best lecture course i went to and his that specific lecture on introducing Fourier series um and solving the three-dimensional um heat equation was like super influential on me like that was i was like i remember being kind of 
riveted and not being able to articulate why I found it so interesting. Sure. And that kind of set me down like a path, I think, of can I try and do psych but in like this engaging storytelling kind of way? Um, yeah, like, yeah, definitely. No, his book did have a lot of history. It was kind of nice, too, because like my uh, the my teacher who was teaching us with that book was very uh I think he enjoyed that. So his notes kind of reflected that. So a lot of times, like while he was teaching a subject, like before he would begin, he would give us like a little bit of history on the subject. And for me, that's is huge. Like, cause that's, I know that that's kind of like a sp- specific learning style, but for me, yeah. that was a good one for me. Cause I just like that. It makes me a little bit more invested in the topic that I'm about to learn. Uh, and definitely influences me when I, I'm doing, you know, certain things on the board behind me during, you know, a, a, you know, typical stream or something, I'll try to throw in a little bit of history or at least like some sort of date on Wednesdays. I actually do like a full history, like lesson on uh, where we talk about like something like we did. What did we do last Wednesday? We did, uh, CN Yang from Yang Mills theory. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So it's just like, we'll just talk about some random occurrence that happened with him and give it like a little background about him, what was going on at the time, what the mood of the physics field was and things like that. So uh, I did appreciate that about Bundle for sure, but I, I was bitter about losing all the points for the typos, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> I just remembered, actually, he is in my most viewed YouTube video. I just remembered. Really? Yeah, the, the, I did a day in the life of an Oxford physics student, which ended up being a pretty representative, to be fair, of my fourth year of like getting up at eight and working until like two or three in the morning. But as part of that, I was the head of publicity for the Physics Society. And he had a lecture. We used to do lectures on Thursdays. And um, but prior to that, we took him out to dinner at a, a little place in uh, Summertown in Oxford. And I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's in that video. Which is- That's awesome. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, uh, but I'm glad. And, I, and it's also important to remember that, like, just because someone, like, makes a few errors in a book, or even if they write a bad book, like, they're not a bad lecturer. They might have something else that they're really, really talented at. And there was uh, and that was something that my advisor would always, in, you know, encourage me to think about. It's just because someone does something like that. <laughs> you know, like, it doesn't make them a, a bad physicist. It just makes them, you know, it just makes that one thing happen, you know? That was me with, J- with um, James Binney, because, like, I did not enjoy his lecture series at all. <laughs> I, I felt I got the, I, I, this is also my opinion on the Feynman lectures, to be fair, but I feel like his course would have been fantastic if you already knew the subject matter. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's not necessarily a good introductory, yeah. you know, lecture course, but it's like, if you already know this stuff, this is a whole slightly different way of doing it. That's going to give you a much deeper appreciation. But if you are trying to learn it for the first time, having somebody who's just like dropping errors of, you know two pi and h bar here and there and like oh yeah, yeah we got yeah. the wrong minus sign but whatever like it's kind of important to get that right <laughs> but you know i know he's this very talented researcher and he just likes tearing getting his teeth into hard maths and yeah all that kind of thing but yeah his, his talents are elsewhere <laughs> very good um <clears throat> so that's cool so uh how about is there anybody who is non like scientific who actually influenced you to like pick up your camera and start be like vlogging well, I mean, I am. Um, Besides I Casey wanted... Neistat, was Casey Neistat? Yeah. <laughs> Casey Neistat's a huge influence for sure. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I used to want to be a filmmaker from quite a young age. Actually, it was probably like oh, just cool. post the paleontology, um, uh, the paleontology kind of era. I remember doing storyboards and concept art for movies and stuff. I think, I think specifically, it was probably the making of sections. What we. Um, my mum bought me the 1997 VHS box set of Star Wars when it was remastered. And so it was the the version when Greedo shoots first, if I remember rightly. Um, and um, they had at the start of each tape like a three minute making of. And just seeing all of that side of things and like this, fan- this fantasy that you saw on screen was, you know, Hoth was Norway and Greenland. And, yeah, you know, yeah. Jabba was this... Uh, was this puppet and how they did the, the the blue screening for the fighters and stuff. And I remember seeing that and just being like, I really, like, that's cool. I, I want to do that. I want to be able to make something like Star Wars. So, like, I guess George Lucas kind of got me started <laughs> in an in a <laughs> indirect way. But, like, yeah, I, I had this interest for kind of all of all of secondary school. I was I was always really interested in filmmaking. And... When I did my first video, I was kind of directly calling back to um, a YouTuber called Charlie McDonnell, who was, is Charlie is so cool, like, uh, he was like a really big hit in the early days of YouTube. And um, I watched a, a load of his videos and other people like now disgraced Alex Day, Neramon, and um, a whole bunch of other people who are now 
actually disgraced and I think about it um, with you know various bad things that they've been doing over the years but um like kind of emulating their style of vloggy type videos um, and yeah I, so I guess it, it was kind of this weird mix of like that really high end I want to make movies with that kind of low end like yeah, these guys are just in their bedrooms with a camera I can right. I have a bedroom I have a camera um, I, I can do this and do you, then, ever, do you ever go back and watch some of those god no because <laughs> i so did bad. i did i wanted to see a couple of them before <laughs> before we did this talk so i was like oh. going back and it was it was good it was good um it's fun to see though because it's fun to see because i mean like one one video of yours that sticks out to uh to me uh besides the blender and the python one was the one where you did uh the meme review because it felt oh, yeah. like there was a lot of editing in that video with a lot of like cool and like fun things. And it wasn't just like your normal, like I'm going to sit here and look at memes. It was like, there was like, you know, you, you did different like uh, animations and stuff to go with your reactions and whatnot. And it was, it was really entertaining. And you know, it's funny to compare that to like one of the video where you're just sitting in like an, un like a seemingly unlit, unlit. room. <laughs> it's like, has one of those like one fluorescent bulb while the other one's just flickering. And you're like, you know, you're just talking to a camera without with, like an internal mic. And it's like really funny to like watch that and then watch where you are now. And it's really kind it's of a, exciting. It, it was a different time, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the standard that is, I, mean, I made this point continually in presentations that the best, um, level of like production isn't necessarily the highest yeah like, if you're trying to get across this idea of this is just me as an individual talking to you uh uh you know about my daily experience at oxford say like it's far better to have a low production value because yeah. otherwise it's like the university is helping you make this and you know how can i trust what you say and, I, and when i did the first week in the life video at exeter i remember i had that problem some people just refused to believe that one person made this that it was like so i had a camera crew with me yeah or, yeah or something like that which, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of flattering to, you know, be told that clearly, you know, one person couldn't have made this. But like, at the same time, it's also a bit frustrating because it's like, no, it's deliberately individual. <laughs> but no, early on, my God, those, I was so limited by the technology I, I had access to. Sure, sure. I mean, well, I, the, I, see, I, the thing is, is like, it's about, it's about that content, you know, like the content's the most important thing. And like, I watched the whole video because I thought it was interesting. Like, and there was, you know, some of it was being invested with, you know, it, with, you know, understanding, you know, a younger version of you. So I could ask you, you know, know what questions to ask you. But the other part mm -hmm. of it is like, I'm genuinely curious to know what happened, like before, before the Exeter, the Exeter days and before the Oxford days and things like that, or at the beginning of the Oxford days. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, it was interesting to watch that. And even though the production quality was low, it, I watched the whole video. It's very interesting, you know, like, um, but yeah, so I, I, are you, are you a kind of like a gear junkie now? Like where you have like a lot of stuff? Uh, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I've, I've, I've got, a th to be fair, actually, the thing that I haven't upgraded for quite a while is my camera. Like okay. I've got, um, I use an ATD for streaming, which is also my main video filming camera. But at some point I would like to upgrade that to something 4k. And even if I'm not outputting in 4k, just having that extra kind of crunch to the image would be nice but yeah I've, i i recently bought a lens just for my warhammer painting streams like <laughs> i oh, seem I to regularly buy something <laughs> i just i just buy i just where is it uh oh it's over there i bought a motion control rig for oh. a, a variety of projects but i so far i've only used it for warhammer um <laughs> yeah like i i uh, i and it is very easy to get sucked down that rabbit hole of like only gear matters. You know, that's how I make yeah. better content. And it's not true. It's it, it helps for sure, but uh, well, there's a, it's, there's it's like a cutoff. You know, little. there's a cutoff to where like it will start hindering your performance versus you know just like the just like having some stuff. Like I had my last laptop was terrible. I just mm. upgraded recently, and my last laptop it'd be like. It would be like I would lose stream like two or three times during the stream. My camera would stop working, like things just like that, because it was just it was done. And everyone would make jokes about how I could like cook eggs and stuff on it, because it would be like <laughs> running constantly, and like my microphone could pick it up. Like it was just so like hot, and it was a big mess. Uh, but like you know, then you know, but there's there's other stuff that I could upgrade instantly, but like it's just not going to influence the content. So I mean, focus. I think I think it's somewhat different now that I. 
like since graduating you know i decided to do this full time and so this is i'm self-employed like you know this is a business that i run i think when you start viewing it as a business it does change your perception of you know if i buy this piece of equipment what content can it help me make um in a way that you just don't worry about when you're a student like right right when i was uh, you know when i started out doing the, the extra regular kind of weekly phd vlogs that was all on what a basic g7x i think and i was kind of reluctantly paying for adobe after about halfway through <laughs> and like you know and that was that was it it was it was i bought a new camera when that camera kind of actually no i bought a new camera when i i went to youtube next up um and like there was like a scholarship type thing um so they i think they picked me because i was doing that kind of unusual educational content and they gave you a scholarship to buy new gear and all that kind of stuff but that was like the only reason why i think otherwise i would have been perfectly happy just carrying on <laughs> but cool. yeah it does come down to like what what kind of content can this help me make like i really want at the moment a drone for example because there might be one video that i'll make where it will did be did you have useful. a drone i did it's a sore subject oh okay <laughs> oh i'm sorry i'm sorry In icarus <laughs> icarus mark three fell out of the sky um it was uh, it, yeah it, like, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't think it was really my fault. I, I was flying it in. There was like a breeze going on, but it wasn't a strong wind. It, I'd flown it in stronger, and I was flying it to get an aerial shot of this church that we were singing at, and uh, it a rotor just pinged off, and it was definitely really? secure. Yeah, I, oh, I know wow. that it was secure because every every time I did a pre flight, like pre flight checks, I made sure that the rotors were on. But one rotor just flew off and then did it plummeted out the sky and landed on the little old lady's car <laughs> oh no did it damage the car yeah she was in it as well oh um, no there was like a dent in the roof and i had oh, to pay for that no. to get buffed out and everything oh no That's i was in such bad. a foul mood for that because i was just before doing a a, a, a concert as well <laughs> I was in such a bad mood <laughs> were you dressed for the concert like were you yeah i was in a suit and everything oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> like this little old lady, the sky falls down on her car, and she's like, "Oh, what was that?" And then you know, a guy in a suit comes running over. She's right. Immediately thought it was government or something like surveillance. Yeah. Get on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you should have done. Just be like, "Take this to the police station. They'll they'll square things away." Yeah. <laughs> Oh That's no! Still in my like finance spreadsheet, I have like a big bump in expenditure in like the first year of running this as a business, where it's like <laughs> pay five hundred pounds for that lady's car to get fixed. And it's like so much more money than I spend on anything else that year. Oh man! It's constantly being reminded. But yeah, like like I have a video that I'd like to get a new drone for, but it's probably just for one video, and it's probably not worth it. To be sure. honest. <laughs> the uh <clears throat> the uh so what's the what's the process like for you coming up with content then do you do you have like a thing that you like to do like go for a walk or, or something like that when you're when you're like if you have like uh you know you want to do something like this later this week or, like film something this week do you have mm -hmm. a process for like for storyboarding that that's different than just like sitting down and writing or is that all it takes so i am um, the way that my videos normally work is they'll have the idea of several months before i make the video like i have a database in notion of like these are video concepts categorized by is this a video essay is this a vlog is this a phd stories video or, or whatever and then i will work out a schedule of if i'm going to make two or three videos in a month you know how are we going to space these out so that the content varies a little bit between each one and then once like i know that a video is coming up i'll have maybe two weeks to get it made and often i'll have like ideas for the script when i first come up with the concept and i'll write those down and then when i come back to it those will kind of get hammered out into something a bit more like a script and then normally yeah you just kind of sit down and bash it into bullet point form sometimes yeah i'll go for a, a walk or or you know, think about it whilst i'm doing something else like a, you know, i don't know doing the washing up or something um but yeah for the most part you just kind of sit down work it out normally then go away and come back the next day and look at the the structure and like is this a good structure am i confident in this and if yes then go ahead with the filming and um you know from there it's kind of on rails it's just put it in however many hours of editing it needs do you feel like you have to, do you feel like you, well, maybe not have to, but do you enjoy like consuming a lot of content, like in order to like come up with ideas? Like, is that something that drives your, your future projects? 
yes and no like i do i watch a lot of youtube but i think a lot of the youtube i watch now <laughs> kind of makes makes sense is stuff that i i wouldn't be making like it's stuff that isn't too close to what i make myself because i think by watching it i would be constantly aware of you know this is what my competitors are doing even though it's not a zero sum game like <laughs> yeah. but it's like you know what are other people doing how can i do this but better like whereas if i watch gaming videos or if i watch a battle report like a warhammer battle report or a painting video it's like i can disassociate myself from the content in a way is that it? i think if i just watch the stuff that i used to watch like just science video essays um i think i would be a bit more I wouldn't be fully relaxed watching it, but I certainly, I, I am of the opinion that you draw inspiration and you get better as a creator by consuming as broadly as possible. Yeah, like, definitely. So watching TV and watching films and watching live streams, you pick up on the stuff that's good and the stuff that's bad. So I, I and I do enjoy um, watching stuff, and particularly with my partner, because I love how when she watches YouTube, it's entirely different to my viewing habits. Um, like she'll watch a lot of vlogs um, and study tubers and shit content. And, you know, she's become so much more cynical because <laughs> of, of knowing me. Like, you know, we will we'll watch something and then she'll be like, wait a minute, she had to like go and set up the camera for that shot. Like that's not genuine at all. And I'm just there like Palpatine, like good. <laughs> like you're starting to see through the lies of the Jedi. I, like, I always do that too. I always wonder like, I'm like, wait a second, the camera, how did the camera get right there? You know, like yeah. it's, it's, it's little subtle things like that that I'm just wait, wait, a, wait a second like, here. Wait a minute, you're wearing a Lavalier microphone. This is, like you knew this was <laughs> happening but and, and like you know pointing out like how ridiculously low effort a lot of the stuff she watches is like <laughs> you just you've you know you've just put your camera in like four different positions across your yeah. day and turned yeah. it into a time lapse and narrated it like this is and then I'll, and then she'll be like do you want to know how many views this has and i'll be like you know don't tell them <laughs> i don't want to know the the, the 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 blender video that i put like heart and soul and how many weeks of development into has got like Eight thousand views. Oh, it's and so good. Who, who got so drunk good. and ordered stuff off Amazon last night, and then has oh, to unbox no. it. Has like thirty thousand views, and you're oh, like, man. I give up. What's the point anymore? <laughs> have you thought about like this is kind of going into like the future? You know, like uh, so we have probably about another fifteen minutes of conversation or so. If you guys are just joining me now, my guest today is Simon Clark. Uh, YouTuber, science communicator, extraordinaire, uh, p climate physics PhD. And uh, and and a, I I would say variety Twitch streamer. Would you say variety? Yeah, Twitch I think streamer? so. Okay. I was just thinking, like, you never hear of people being described as like a science communicator, like ordinaire, like <laughs> like <laughs> extraordinaire is probably overstating it, but like you know, streamer, <laughs> video maker, ordinaire. I, I put that on my tombstone. <laughs> um, and that that so yeah, so uh, we're here in conversation. Uh, we're gonna do a a, a live Q and A in about hmm. uh, probably 15 or so minutes. So if you have questions, exclamation mark, ask, followed by your question. Uh, and that will go into a queue where I can uh, take a look at that after we're done. Uh, of course, exclamation mark, Simon, like N. Burroughs has. Um, <clears throat> if you would like to know more about Simon and where you can follow him and find him. Uh, let's see here. Oops, hold on. Uh, and then uh, if you want the command, you can write exclamation mark, ask me for directions. That will give you those directions that I just um, said. Oh, and Gonzo, remind me, and author now, uh, which we're going to get into soon. But before we oh. do, um, I'm kind of curious about like uh, what your um, what you see for your future endeavors in science communication as far as production goes like you mentioned you are interested in a uh in the drone but uh like one thing that i'm interested in is uh at some point join joining a larger um a larger group like a larger organization like i've done a lot of uh, work with the world science festival hmm. um out of new york city which i really enjoy uh and uh i've you know i've taught and they teach i mostly have, i've been with uh, teaching with little little children like between the ages of like three and, and 12 or 13 and but like their parents are so interested and I, I, I like being uh, I like being there because like the uh, students are fun to, to teach and stuff and inspire but then you know the dad or the or the mom will come up to me and be like how does that work though like really <laughs> though how does it work and then I'll you know I'll get to like you know go into a deeper explanation so like for me like the future for me uh, I would love to work at like a big place like CERN or the World Science Festival or something doing science communication for a uh, you know a larger 
organization. Um, and, and so where do you see yourself at? Do you see yourself taking like a Veritasium route where you start to hire like a bunch of people? Do you see yourself, you know, merging with a larger organization? Where do you see yourself in like five to 10 years, just in like the, the Simon Clark YouTube aspect? Yeah. I mean, I think something, one of the reasons why I did this full time after the PhD was because I really valued in the PhD being my own boss and like being in charge of my own time. Like <clears throat> seeing so many other people um, who I went to undergrad with and, you know, then went on to get real world jobs. You know, they are, if they want to take time off, they have to ask somebody and, you know, they are locked into a schedule. And I really like the fact that I got up and I, I set my own schedule. I knew effectively, I guess I, I knew what was best for me at any given time. And then I just followed through with it. So I, I think I wouldn't see me joining a larger organization partly because of that um and because now after so, have a couple of years of running this i do kind of like running my own business like i am not business minded mm -hmm. I, I am so like not aggressive enough in order to you know in order to make this work I, I'm, I'm less of a darcy and more of a bingley unfortunately but like I, I i like doing this and i feel like in the future i would definitely see myself working with other people more um okay. whether that's on my channel and we've you know this <clears throat> in the next couple of videos that are coming out there's a couple of projects where i'm collaborating heavily with other people um and uh you know that's something that i've been really enjoying doing but also there's another channel which i'm hoping to set up this summer which is based on the, the climate coding that we've been doing with our model claude of um re treating it as a show of using the output from this model to answer questions about hypothetical planets but like i would produce it i would maybe narrate it but then there would be a team of people who would help me write it who would edit it who would do the graphics and that would now be to be a bit more hands-off and more of a producer sorry i just realized my cat's trying to get out um <laughs> i just i didn't realize she was locked in here with me the entire time uh let me hang on let me introduce yep. your audience to her one sec okay here comes the cat. Go. Jasmine? Jasmine? Oh, Jasmine. stay there. There we go. So this is, for, sorry, for Eric's audience, this is Jasmine. Jasmine. That's right. She's I thought it was Jasmine. 18 years old now. A very old. We, 18 we were, years old? Yeah. We were, we were talking about, um, to a landlord about renting a new property. And we had to say, so um, we do have to ask, what's your opinion on pets? But like, very inactive pets. Like, you know, she really doesn't do anything other than just sleep, but we kind of have to ask. Um, so, <laughs> are you not going to be a problem? <laughs> Why are you? Oh, yeah, we now have the four part <laughs> emote. <laughs> Look at that. It looks so intimidating, Jasmine. Look at you. You got the eye of the tiger in there. Right. Do you want to go out? She isn't very talkative when she's not hungry. Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> right. Ah, 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 ah. My arm, my, ah, my arm. <laughs> Mm. Oh. Oh. my god she clings on for dear life <laughs> oh. but yeah so like that's that's a future project the, the planet factory project um cool very cool and and you know i think i i would always see myself doing the production of at least a couple of things on my channel because i um i like doing it like i i like making videos at the end of the day uh, even if it was just for you know if it wasn't monetized or sponsored or anything like that i i take a huge amount of artistic joy in making stuff and especially when you're trying new techniques that you've never used before like when i started using blender that was not a video that i made because i thought it would be you know profitable or anything it was because i think this looks cool and i want it to exist and in an i think success like in the long run for me would be being able to just do stuff like that. So, you know, be successful enough that I have other projects like Planet Factory or, you know, if, if there are several books that have come out that, uh, you know, are popular, like to just have the time to be able to say, this is a cool visualization I want to make, or this is a video concept that I just think should exist, you know? So yeah, like I, I, I would always do some production, but I could definitely see myself going down that route of sort of overlooking a small team and particularly trying to give people some experience like 
yeah. I know how t tough it is to get started in this kind of thing as, as a science communicator in particular. Um, yep. Yep. And to, <laughs> yes, you know, give is. people give people that experience of, you know, do you want to come and write some some videos for me? Um, yeah, it's so <laughs> weird, too, because like I like when I started, I had zero following on any platform at all. And I made a single Reddit post which got me started like that was it just a, a single reddit post but like there was a large uh, a large community of educators uh known as the knowledge fellowship for anybody who doesn't know tkf you can uh i think exclamation mark tkf will tell you a little bit more about them if you're interested but it's a large amount of twitch streamers that are interested in educational content and you know i found them and they found me and that was probably the only reason that like I ended up having people watch past a couple weeks. Now I had like a few people who are still around, Jackson and and uh, NC non dairy neutrino, who've been here literally since like day one of streaming. <laughs> but uh, but there's you know but most most of the people that came the first day from the red post just stopped. And then there's like you can, it's weird. It's a weird thing because even like the people that have been around for that long can't be here always. So like what yeah. do you do when you're trying to teach someone physics but there's nobody to teach? So like yeah. having having that like having a little bit of a boost in the beginning to work with someone who's you know and talented and successful would be great you know so that's that's huge, um, and uh, I guess I I wonder also like do you ever see yourself getting back into academia at some point like as as a professorial, uh, potentially like I um I didn't have the best experience during the PhD because I, I was in a small research group and my supervisor had never supervised anyone before he he'd worked in industry for. A long, long time, and I think uh, those two factors combined meant that we. I just didn't. I didn't feel like I was being productive, and I wasn't being guided. Like in my fourth year, well, sorry, over the summer of my third year at Oxford, I did a research project that turned into a paper. We wrote it up. Um, I even went to Germany to present it at a conference, and then like flew back for lectures, the lectures the next day. And I feel like that whole experience was more productive to me. I had a bigger, Im like a more positive impact on me as a researcher than possibly my entire PhD, because I just felt like I was actually given direction on that project. And it was like, you know, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Off you go. And, you know, you're not, a PhD is not like that. It's not somebody holding your hand the whole way, but it is, you know, it's it's like the learning how to ride and the the phd is the process of taking the stabilizers off a phd is not you remove the stabilizers and then you push them down a hill which right. is kind of i feel like what i had so that that did kind of put me off um um that did kind of put me off academia but um i could totally see myself returning either as a teaching role or uh more in like researching science communication because i think i found that a lot more interesting now than a lot of the actual atmospheric questions that i had when i finished the phd um there are still things that like academic questions i had and ideas that i would have wanted to put into the thesis but we didn't have time um slash supervision um and you know I, i'm still interested in the answers to those but i feel like if i was to go back it would probably be more of that somebody doing full-time psychom at the university and studying how how it works, what's effective, um, and how institutions can interact with individuals. Because that's one of the big things that I'm still struggle with a bit is even though I was I was on the inside, I was I was like institutionalized, I still struggle to interact with big institutions for when it comes to you know science communication. Um, and working out how to do that effectively, I think is a really big challenge for SciComm. And maybe that'd be an interesting thing to research. Um, well, there's now. Yeah. I think that's becoming more of a popular thing too, because uh, like I think about the Alan Alda Center for Science Communication at Stony Brook University. Like that's a whole like, I mean, a whole group of people dedicated to teaching academics how to communicate their ideas and yeah. like stuff like that. I think there's potential for that in academics because uh, I think we're realizing now more than we did in the past that like we struggle to do science communication you know properly yeah. like we don't it's hard to do like the things where you have to uh like hide in a closet and do a bunch of research with a bunch of other people in a closet and like not be able to like go outside of the closet and then you go outside the closet and you're trying to tell someone about what you did and you pretty much end with uh well you had to be there type deal from the beginning because you yeah. don't know exactly how to say it so i like to see stuff like that and i think that that's huge and exciting um I hope that there's more of them because I would love, you know, I would love to be in a role like that 
as well in the future, like something where like I could, you know, after doing it for so long, just sort of tell people the things I learned, how I got better, things like that. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's an interesting, uh, definitely an interesting thing. I think that, I hope that that becomes more of a, um, of a well, it's, it's, thing. it's not something that I um I was looking at originally, but there was actually a, a postdoctoral position available at um I think it was King's College, Cambridge, um which is relatively near me now. But I'm actually moving back to the West Country, where there are several really good universities, super close to where we're moving, and like that's a thing that I am. If I was to ever go back to an institution, that is the kind of role that I would be looking for. I think, which you know, could be could be cool. Very. Uh, so <clears throat> now let's talk about your book. Tell me about your book. <laughs> oh God, I'm gonna have to get so used to this. This is the you first get, time. Yeah, I've you have to have like a sound bite, like written out. Yeah. Like, this is my book. <laughs> Wait, not having a physical copy here is like the. I can. <laughs> it'd be so useful if I had like a pro. Next to me, I have a gigantic box from Games Workshop. Um, <laughs> like that's so my uh. My, my Hold book, it up and say, this is your book, yeah. <laughs> it's called Curse City. It's a very limited run. Um, so basically, it's, it's um, an introductory view at atmospheric science. So it's not a book that's aimed at people from uh, with a scientific background. It's trying to be what I would call a personal statement book. It's the kind of thing that you would read to work out if you're interested enough in a subject to study it to a higher level. Um, and also would be interesting to people who are just interested in the atmosphere because that's, that's what it is about right it's, it's atmospheric science but it's not about climate or weather specifically it's about the physical system at the heart of all of that and more specifically how we worked out what we know about the atmosphere um so going back to that blundell uh, discussion like i find that so much more interesting the the stories of how um uh, <laughs> to, to give a tidbit uh, for example um the jet stream Right, so the the jet stream is this narrow moving uh, narrow ribbon of fast moving air in the mid latitudes that's driven by uh, eddies, so different de deviations from the zonal mean circulation, and um, it traditionally people say it was discovered in uh, the I think it was 1948 by the University of Chicago Meteorology Department, but it was discovered before in 1943 I want to say by a Japanese researcher called Uishi. But nobody paid him any attention because he was also in the Japanese Esperanto Society. And he uh, published his paper that was like of world changing significance to meteorology in Esperanto that nobody could read. Um, like he published something like 19 papers on the jet stream and nobody read them because nobody else could speak or read Esperanto. Um, so like that, that kind of, that in, in kind of flavor to a physical phenomenon is so much more interesting to me than just, yeah. oh, it's a f ribbon of fast moving air. Um, but one of the, the main objectives of the book is to kind of tie together various, uh, other factors into the evolution of atmospheric science. So how technological developments uh, influenced how we interact with the atmosphere, what we were capable of measuring, what we perceived it to be, um, and societal changes and economic changes, uh, how they changed how we gather information and what we could actually, you know, what we, we could from an information perspective ever hope to learn about the atmosphere changed with the advent of proto-globalization. Like all of these kind of larger scale questions um, and then using that to build up this perception of the atmosphere of what the physical system is, how it works, how we know about that, and then using that understanding to uh, link the physical system to weather prediction and to climate change. Because to me, at least, when people talk about climate or weather, the, the, it's almost completely abstract. There, it, there's very little actually relating it to the physical atmosphere. And I, I wanted to change that. I wanted people to know how we arrived at these conclusions, kind of contextualize the science that took place that enables weather prediction and contextualize the discovery of global warming. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it, it's a science book. It's an introductory science book for people that like those broader kind of how science engages with the rest of society. Yeah, Quim, uh, Quim King says, just knowing a little bit about the, uh, why the color of the sky uh, yeah. <clears throat> changes add so much wonder to the to the to the topic. It's very good. Um, so uh, 
I, I, it's I, like I almost kind of thought when you when you were announcing it on YouTube, which by the way, go to uh, Simon's YouTube and watch the newest video on his book and where you can pre-order it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I almost thought it would be like a wonderful like textbook companion for a class right where you can have like you talk about like a subject but before you talk about like the the you know the rigor or the uh you know the deeper scientific knowledge you kind of like have to motivate it and like textbooks yeah. often don't do a good job motivating study you know, topics to study so i thought like maybe this would be like a really cool like you know textbook companion for a class i hadn't considered that but if like a university put it as part of its set reading that would be unbelievable <laughs> um, the idea that i could like be mentioned in a reading list is is absolutely mad to me but yeah hopefully it would fill that kind of role i suppose it, it would be the other aspects of you know science modern science is quantitative but that's not all it is it's and and part of you know it, it's almost like arriving at a destination without having undertaken the journey like do people who teleport in star trek have as 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 engaging a relationship with the planet if they teleport down to the surface versus if they go down in their Honda Previa, uh, you know, ships. Like, uh, I have, God, you put that possibility in my brain now. <laughs> well, I'm saying like, uh, I'm, so I'm teaching intro physics this summer. So if I teach uh, it again a, a year from summer, I'll make sure I put it on my reading list. And my well, students will just be like, <laughs> I don't know, you're doing electricity magnetism. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> you have to I read mean, a chapter a day. <laughs> I mean, that's the, like, I've, th let's not count chickens yet. I'm now at the point where we've announced it and it's like, people are excited about it. And I kind of want to tell people like, wait, wait, wait it might not be good. <laughs> like, it's great that you're excited and you pre-ordered the book, but it still might not be good. <laughs> no, it's a huge accomplishment. And like, it's, it's exciting to think like, so, so again, it, we, you know, talking about the future, like uh, if, if, how do you see your do you see yourself writing another book? Do you have plans to write another book? Yeah, I have um I have an idea for doing a, a, another one which I think I would be well positioned to write and I'd have to do some research to work out if this hasn't already been done because I've kind of been a bit busy the past couple of years um <laughs> with other with other book projects but uh I I'd love to do one on geoengineering as kind of like a popular introduction to it as a concept and laying all the science out that we currently understand um which i think would be a worthwhile book i think there would be a lot of social value to it because it's a subject that people don't understand as well as they should considering the impact that it could have on this century it could be the technology that defines the 21st century for all we know um and i am not aware of a popular introduction to it and i think the, the other thing is that like i think i talk about maybe two people who are still alive in firmament like it's it's so much of it is old science whereas with geoengineering there are so many people who um who are currently researching it that uh you know we could actually do interviews and it would be a very different beast i think making making a, a book on, on that kind of topic but um i also have like you know, I'm a dedicated Warhammer fan. I have like two Warhammer novels planned out in my head that if they ever come <laughs> calling, I, I basically am ready to go. Nice. Nice. I think I, I tried once. I got the pieces. Uh, I got the piece. I got uh, some pieces, not many, uh, not enough mm. for like a full game, but I got some pieces and I assembled them and never painted them. And I think my brother and I played one round. And by that point, I realized in order to play like an actual round, I needed to buy a lot more and was like oh <laughs> I, I would I... recommend you like this box but uh unfortunately the, the games workshop is is currently uh, in the process of absolutely crapping itself because they've removed all references to this product even existing oh um, no yeah no one really knows what's going on it looks like there might be some kind of legal problem but i i need to finish off my previous painting i'm going to leave this in wrapping for now because it might turn out to be like the most valuable collectible ever um, nice. But but yeah, like they've they've evolved it a lot. You you can get stuff now. They, there there are versions of the game you can play with like five models each um, that are really engaging. And cool. I even got my fiance to play a game with me. Nice. So you know, super super accessible. I went the uh, I went the uh, the Pokemon card route. That's where I went with uh, with expensive toy games i went to the play the pokemon cards i actually like oh, yeah. two, like a year not even two years ago a year ago and actually i tried to do a couple streams with my brother where we where we played pokemon cards but uh uh i uh <clears throat> i got that and then my brother moved away so now i have all these pokemon cards and it's just like i don't really know what to do with them now <laughs> so i still i still have part of my collection from when i was a kid well because my mom so my mom used to work at my primary school and my primary school banned 
uh, Pokemon cards. And I specifically remember this. A kid called Max Crichton tried to, it was in my class, tried to steal someone else's Magmar. And I was like, you got Pokemon cancelled over a Magmar. Like, it's a, it's a crap card to get this. It's like 50 hit points. And, um, and But basically, they had, like, uh, this this collection of Pokemon cards that they confiscated. And they would um, they had, like, in this big box. And when Mum left the school, she just brought this box home with her. So I have, like, 2,000 Pokemon cards at home in this box. Some, some of them are, like, I've got quite a few shinies in there. Um, yeah. But, like, it's... I know there was that fad not too long ago of like oh, Pokemon cards Twitch? going for oh, crazy man. money. I I felt like weird about that. Like I didn't even I I did not watch it. I did not like it. I just thought like you're getting like there's weird there's weird things I just don't trust in Twitch sometimes, yeah. and that was one of them because I was just like your trust like you have a lot of younger influential or influent easily influenced viewers, and I was like and you just spent. Two hundred thousand dollars on a pack of, on a box set or whatever yeah. of cards or whatnot. I was just like, this is insane. But remember that, like, the young influencers are also like doing the same same stuff. Like the stuff that we do, I don't think is as important as actually the the people who are like you know kind of teenagers or preteens who are using the platform because they're like the peers to the people yeah. that we are worrying about influencing. And I know this because my so my my partner's a teacher and one of her students. I'm not going to say in which year, but it's a young one um is like a really big youtuber and you, we watch her videos sometimes and it's like my god this is shit like this is <laughs> not only is this bad content but like this is sending such bad messages like it, yeah. and you know and then we worry about like you know oh should i unbox pokemon cards is this accidentally like you know uh, encouraging commercial behavior and this person's making videos like i walk blindfolded into a shop and whatever i touch i have to buy <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like oh, oh never mind no. i guess i'm having no influence here at all oh man yeah there's like there's yeah they, they, it's it's a weird it's a weird culture and like i i worry about like my kids watching youtube so like it's very it's a very heavily monitored like uh you know activity when they want to watch youtube and they and they like yeah. to watch it because i mean i mean there's so much stuff that they could do they want like my daughter right now is really into gymnastics she wants to watch a lot of gymnastics oh, cool. content right and uh and it's like one of those things where it's like you can watch it if we're also there watching it with you because there's just so much stuff i don't want you to watch that's easily yeah. available but where else are you gonna find someone doing gymnastics in like a real it's not on not on the youtube kids app i'm guessing like it has to be on the <laughs> the full version of the app wait there's a youtube kids app there's yeah, there's a YouTube Kids app that has like no adverts on it. It's all approved content. Really? I thought that yeah. there was just like a. I thought there was just like a setting that you had to like when because like whenever I put something on YouTube, it's kind of like you know, is this for kids? And you have to put no so that you know you th they can comment and blah 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 and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But like, it a, actually um... goes to an app that has for kids. Yeah, there's YouTube Kids. Wow. Well, I think I'm not sure what the age range is. Like, I don't know if that's you know if it's for zero to four year olds say or if it's like four to ten years <laughs> it's nothing but whatever. coco melon it's just like coco melon <laughs> has like a monopoly it's just baby it. shark <laughs> all of the recommended <laughs> videos 10 hours of baby shark um that's that's awesome because that also will save your youtube recommended because i know for a fact i have friends who have kids like they'll you know the kids will be like oh can i borrow your phone and then suddenly they'll watch like two videos and all of their recommended videos like peppa pig like it's <laughs> you know ruins their experience <laughs> Yeah, well, we had I had a just different account for them, and it's just like you can watch that ah. on this account, so I don't have to get. I don't. Yeah, really yeah. Want them. You, look at look at YouTube Kids because that that as uh, seems to be. I, I don't know quite how like creators that work on that actually make it work as a job because uh -huh. you can't monetize on it. But, okay. Uh, I don't know, but so yeah, no, because I used to I used to be really into gymnastics. I I did it in primary school. Oh, really? um, For for a couple of years, I I never got to the point where I was like actually doing anything impressive. But like, I remember doing uh, like summer school classes and I did an after school class in it. Um, and then I, I think I basically got salty that I wasn't good enough compared to the girls who were doing it. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, I can't do flips. <laughs> oh man. Uh, all right. So again, we are about to start the question and answers. I have one more question for uh, Simon, but before I do that, if you, uh, so my guest today, maybe it was, uh, my guest today is Simon Clark, uh, climate phys physicist uh phd and a uh and a science communicator on youtube and twitch uh if you have questions about anything this is your time to ask climate physics questions because i get oh, climate physics questions 
I don't know the answer. And I have to say, I don't know the answer. And then I usually say, there is a climate physicist on Twitch you can go follow named Dr. Simon Clark. But um, but if you have questions about climate physics... I can't physics, guarantee that I will know the answers, of course. <laughs> now is the time to ask them. So, uh, and then after that, we're going to move into a game uh, where you will be playing, you will be taking on uh, Simon and I in a game of, uh, of um, GeoGuessr with our good old friend Click Maps. So we will... I will explain all of how that works in uh, when we get to there. But before we do, I have one more question. Well, we have we have about ten questions. So if we if we get any more questions, that's fine. Go ahead and ask. And uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, I want to ask. I want to end with one question that I'm curious about because um, I don't know if I ever heard you say it, and I was I'm I'm just genuinely curious about it. Uh, what is your fondest moment or memory? Uh, directly related to content creation, like was it an ev like meeting someone, an event, a video? Uh, what was it? What's your fondest memory? Bloody hell! Uh, that's a really hard question, actually, um, because there's so many little moments when you do this job. Like you will capture a piece of video, and you like know that oh, that's a great shot. That is going in the video. There was. Um, there was a, a moment when I was at CERN, I remember I did this video interviewing and sort of profiling, if you like, um, a girl called Asher, who's doing a PhD in antimatter there. And we visited the LHC, ooh, was it LHC? I think it was LHCB. It was one of the, the big collider experiments. Yep. And, um, you know, she was using uh, a camera to take a picture and then she noticed I was taking video and then like she waved. And I was like, that is, so going in the video <laughs> like, and it was just everything in the, like me it, it kind of crystallized like i've been invited to come to cern to do science communication stuff which is insanely cool that's, I've, been that's partnered, awesome. yeah. I've been i've been partnered with somebody who gets it and is really willing to be on camera we're here at the lhc like the the, the epicenter almost of world physics research right and we got the shot like we got this amazing shot out of it and i think i think that that was like a moment that really hit me um Oh, man, there are so many moments. Like the number of times when I've been editing and something will slot into place and I'll be like, yes, that's it. That's that's how this is going to work. Um, being Going to New York was really cool. I went to the Global Creator Camp and- um, New York City? Yeah, New York City. Oh, and awesome. uh, it was hosted in the, the YouTube space rip there. And um, they, uh, you know, we had like a week of kind of programmed talks and workshops and stuff. And they surprised us one day with um, a press thing for, oh God, what was the name of the film? Uh, the Post. Um, and we, we all met Tom Hanks. Oh. And like, you just turn around a corner and like, there was Tom Hanks. That was like a real, like, I have no idea what to do with my hands right now kind of moment. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's, yeah. Uh, there is, I was, at the World Science Festival, I uh, you know that's founded by Brian Green and his wife Tracy Day. Oh right, yeah. And uh, so you know I met Brian a couple of times, or Dr. Green should be more formal. I met Dr. Green a few times, and he's very nice. Uh, and uh, his wife's very nice and stuff. And um, but then uh, one day I was sitting there like tending to the doors, just making sure everybody knew where they were going and things like that, because I was volunteering for them. And uh, uh, th it just right in front of me was Alan Alda, which I thought was pretty wild. And like, you know, and I didn't even know what to say. I didn't want to bother him. So I was just like, I'm just going to let him go. And like, everybody's like around him with like walkie talkies. They had like a code name for him and stuff. And I didn't even know all of a sudden, like I had like four red shirts walk past me and they're like, the Hawk is in the building. The Hawk is in the building or something like that. And I was just like, what's happening? And all of a sudden Alan Alda's like right in front of me. And I'm just like, Oh, <laughs> and I was just like, enjoy the show. <laughs> Don't say anything. Have, have a good time. If everyone calls him the hawk, I probably should just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> like, yeah, do you, you assert dominance and start using his code word to him. <laughs> <laughs> Good day, hawk. It's like, it's like, it's like oh, this guy's a deep plant. I've never even seen him before. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so that's cool. That's that's really exciting. Yeah, I always thought it'd be fun to do. Um, I really hope TwitchCon happens because I really like to do that. I'd really like to go to I, TwitchCon. I, and... I, I've done Summer in the City in London. I've done two VidCons in Europe. And uh, one TwitchCon, and TwitchCon was by far my favorite experience. Really cool. cool. Well, I think partly because like with with 
um, VidCon, everybody was like screaming and following after famous, you know, like teenage bloggers or whatever, which is the <laughs> nature of YouTube. Yeah. Whereas on, on Twitter, and even in the green room, like you were, there was like a hierarchy of, oh, you know, I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not famous enough to talk to them. Um, whereas on TwitchCon, it was so, there were obviously people kind of meeting their favorite streamers, but because they felt like they knew them anyway, I think right. from watching them on Twitch, there was less of a hype around it. And in the green room, like for all the, the streamers, <clears throat> something that I realized there was if you are a famous Twitch streamer, you do not have time to watch Twitch because you are streaming all the time. Yeah. So like the people who were really big streamers, you just, you know, and, and I say big, I'm including my, myself in that metric, like people who have say more than a thousand followers, yep. like we'd all be meeting and like, I remember meeting people and they'd be like, you know, just, just chill and chatting. And then I'd look their name up afterwards and they'd have like a million followers. Yeah. And it's like, and it was just so totally like, it was so much more on a level than YouTube. It was so much less of like a, a high school, you can't sit with us kind of clique. Um, but I just really liked, I really, really liked TwitchCon. It was very cool. Yeah, they also I had, had a bizarre keynote from um, David Hasselhoff. <laughs> David Hasselhoff came in and gave this talk about like, okay. you guys are the are the future. And like, n nobody knew what on earth he was talking about. And it went on for quite some time. Okay. That, that was really something. Um, yeah, that's funny. And I, I had a moment like that actually yesterday because I was looking at I was looking at some metric of mine uh, and I saw that there was a follower that I recognized. And uh, cause I've had conversations with him in chat, you know, and I, and I knew he was a partner, but I didn't really like know anything about him and i looked him up yesterday just out of curiosity and he had like he had over a thousand viewers and his average was like two to three thousand viewers wow. like regular and i was just like i didn't know that like it's like the weirdest <laughs> thing like you know so it, it is like that where like you, you, you know you can interact with people who mm. in uh but i do feel that way with youtube or like i feel like some people are untouchable as far as that in that concern but then again i i don't really i'm not in the youtube sphere like i i am a streamer by nature like i don't know how to do good youtube content most of my <laughs> youtube content is things that i've do, i've do, i've specifically said okay i'm gonna do a segment on twitch live and i'm just gonna put the live segment on youtube because yeah you know it's a live segment and that's a video right there but i don't know exactly how i would do something like you know like make a video with a lot of editing and things like that that would be a complete honestly the way new... you do it is the smarter way of doing it like if i was smart i would just do you uh, twitch streaming all the time pay somebody else to edit highlights there you go it's a different style of content but in terms of like the amount of effort that goes into one minute of a youtube video and you know weighing that against the reward of one minute right. of a youtube video compared to twitch there is just no competition at all like I'm, i've kind of got stockholm syndrome i guess at this point i've just been doing it for so long <laughs> that i've told myself i do enjoy doing this uh all right so let's move on to some uh questions from you all again if you have some questions write exclamation mark ask followed by your questions we'll do uh we have 12 we'll do a, a couple more minutes and then i'll close the queue so whatever is in there will be in <clears> there um for this so the first question comes from dan hanvey uh if you hadn't chosen physics as the core route you went down uh what would you have gone into english music geography etc um oh, it's such a tough one because like i i was very lucky in that like i really found every subject at gcse level sort of before you you make the specialization kind of easy like i just i, I just kind of took to those courses well and I had a really tough time even narrowing down to those courses I, I probably would have gone down either the history route or the English route I think I wouldn't have done maths for example I definitely I think it would have definitely been a um uh like a humanities based subject possibly uh I had to make a really hard choice to drop drama classes when I was uh what, like 14 and I was really passionate about performing and being on stage and I, I i i think that's one of the reasons why i like doing videos because it is basically the same thing um and maybe if i hadn't done that that would have been the thing i would have ended up doing i would have gone to like film school or acting school or, or something but what was your favorite probably, probably uh that you were that you were in that you were involved in oh bloody hell um i never really did full productions to be fair because it was at the age where it was the next level that you got to do like the big school productions um so we just did like these small things that were kind of oh we're gonna watch the 13 year olds do a five minute production of rumpelstiltskin uh <laughs> but I, I i didn't get to do anything sort of like big on stage unfortunately 
<clears throat> Very good. Okay, so the next one is Gonzo Blue. And if you have a question uh, that's for me, because I know a lot of people in here are from Simon's chat, just feel free to uh, feel free to make that known. Otherwise, I'm probably mm. not going to answer these because we're getting kind of up there. So, <laughs> uh, Gonzo Blue, do you have a date when we can pre-order your book in the United States? I have that question too. Yeah, I know you I'm... said I know you said you don't, but. I, I really wish I knew. Um, I had I had an email from my editor today, and there's no update on it. It's a law thing. It's to do with how they uh, are distributing the book, and you have to like acquire an international like you have to sign international rights. This is why I have an agent, by the way, because no way am I doing this myself. Um, so like, yeah, they are still talking uh, about how to do that. I hopefully it won't be too long, but I couldn't even give you an estimate. They, they said a couple of months probably, uh, but uh, I don't know, unfortunately. I, I wish I knew. Understandable, understandable. I, I guess there's like, it's kind of interesting to watch because I've always been kind of curious about some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the formalities of like publishing a book and stuff and how that's going to, how, how that affects like you, like what is the steps to take? So, um, yeah, they've been doing this for hundreds of years. How have they not like nailed this down? <laughs> I, I like, it's so, they surely feel like they have, and that we're just like, you know, you just have to put up with it because they're all set with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like but, but like if Stephen Hawking was still alive and was like, I'm going to write a new book. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have to wait several months for like his, the American <laughs> followers true. to find out when it's, it's going to be released. It's true. I, uh, I actually, I met him. That, well, I didn't meet him, but I saw the back of him once in Cambridge because <laughs> his, um, his, uh, so he went to Gonville and Keys College, uh, or rather he was a fellow at Gonville and Keys. And um, that was where my girlfriend at the time was studying. And I saw his back retreating into like the fellow's garden. But apparently the, uh, the students there called him Wheelie Steve. That was his nickname. <laughs> That's a bold nickname. But I'm pretty sure he <laughs> apparently had a great Steve. sense of humor. Like he used to, because he used to go to formal dinners sometimes. And like there, there was a, a friend of my my partner, my then girlfriend, who was like sat next to him and tried engaging in conversation with him. But every time he was just about to like finish typing his response, they asked another question. And like, apparently he cottoned on and was <laughs> just like started taking the piss. Like, you wouldn't think it, but like he had apparently this really good sense of humor about, about the whole thing. Alrighty, we're gonna uh close the queue because we're getting up there in questions, uh, and we might do like a little rapid in towards the end. But uh, sure, sure. for now, uh, let's go. Uh, so Perkins uh says, is physics heading towards explaining evolution of life? Is there a clear relationship between biology and physics? Um, that's a really tough question. Um, that's that's a question for someone like Sally the Page. Oh no, she doesn't know physics. Um, <laughs> that's the thing. But it's not a physics question to, to me, at least. Like, it's that that is an evolutionary biology question. Like, I think the physic the physics of how chemical bonds form and would have formed in the proto Earth, like that's known. It's we we have we have solved that problem. Yeah. It's now down to the oh Jesus, he's just messaged me on Facebook. <laughs> Hang on, let me just check this. No, okay, we're good. She's not watching this. <laughs> oh, that is um, funny. Yeah, like I, I, I feel like that is not a physics question. Now that is a, yeah, it's a biochemistry question. I'd say. I, I don't know if you have a different opinion on that. I, I have an opinion. Uh, where I, I, uh, it's probably wrong. Um, but I, what I would imagine is one of the complications for, for understanding this is, um not having a good grasp of complexity theory uh and, and i think that if we could spend if we knew more about you know the p versus np and we could understand some more things like protein folding and the way that i think a lot of that has a lot to do with the uh, evolution like i think you can um right now i imagine we don't know how to solve that problem in right. any type of, of computational sense you know what i mean so, and so i think you're, that's you're, you're doing this as like an information flow problem yeah yeah. And yeah. I think that if we had a better understanding of that and maybe uh, maybe quantum computing might help. Um, so invest in quantum <laughs> computing. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, I think that maybe like something like that might be a, a, a help in that situation. But I don't see it directly. It'd be a, uh, it'd be one of these crossovers that like the Santa Fe Institute does where you have like a quantum computer physicist working with a biophysicist and or a bio or just a biologist. And, and that was I remember when I was um, 
at the Physics Society in Oxford, they they did they had a lecture on quantum biology, and it was one of the most interesting things I'd seen. They had like they were they were looking at a a type of relatively deep sea. Uh, oh god, what type is it? Is it phytoplankton? The ones that photosynthesize, and they basically had worked out this way of engaging photosynthesis with singular photons, and having to actually worry about you know like single photon effects passing through and scattering through stuff that I just I don't know I'd never I'd never considered quantum biology before and just the the idea of that field existing kind of blew my mind I'd love to learn more about that to be fair I'm sure there'll be an interesting p uh, paper like to, to to read to get to grips with it yeah I have there's a there's one uh there's one person at my university who used to study uh particle physics and uh, we have this weird relationship where, like, some of uh, – because we're so close to Cornell. My university is Binghamton University in upstate New York. So we're so close to Cornell University that, like, Cornell University will hire a physicist and – or just a, a, a professor. And if they're married to somebody that the department doesn't have room for, then my university will take them on as an adjunct and uh, Cornell will pay their way. And the way that that kind of works is, like, usually the, the professor gets a chance at taking tenure at my university. So we have one professor who did that, and we didn't really need a particle physicist at that point. So what he ended up doing is kind of finding, like, a, this happy ground where he does a little bit of particle physics, but a lot of bio, of biophysics. And very experimental versus what he used to do as a theoretical particle physics. But um, that's kind of where he's at right now, and I think that's a cool – that's a cool um, – Don Wallerman is actually recommended Life on the Edge by Jim Al Khalili. I am going to have to check that out. There Thank you, you Don. Life on the Edge. I'm not surprised that a book about quantum biology is, is by Jim Al Khalili. Yeah. I've met him very briefly. Um, oh, really? Before. Yeah, he was a. Oh, was it St. John's? That was a. Yeah, he was like coming in and because he, he was doing some filming in the physics department, I think. But he was also giving a talk, maybe. I had a funny, I had a funny dream one time. There's this a a, a judge on a food show uh, called um, uh, ki uh, Cutthroat Kitchen, and mm. his name is Simon M Majumdar or something like that, and he looks just like Jim Alkalili. And I had a dream <laughs> that after watching Cutthroat Kitchen, that I was in a car ride with Jim Alkalili, and it was instead of being actual Jim Akalili, it was Simon Majumdar just yelling at me the entire <laughs> time. But it was like I had to. I treated him, talked, called him, you know, you know, Mr. Akalili, and, and it was about science and everything like that. But it was just him yelling at me. It was it was terrifying. Um. Anyways, so Sh <laughs> Shikitsu says uh, it seems to me like the hurdle for a streamer to educate people that are all at different uh, places in their education. How do you navigate around that? Oh yeah, now that's the really hard thing. Um. I, I try to make clear when I do, um, well, I sort of, my original format for doing educational streams was doing past papers. And I stopped doing that purely because the pandemic meant that in the UK, at least like exams were canceled. Mm -hmm. And I kind of didn't want to rub it in almost by like, this is what you would have been doing. I do actually think that I, I quite like to bring him back because there will be a benefit to people for exam technique because that is its own skill set really um <clears throat> and when i did those it was like right we are going to be looking at this paper but from this level of knowledge and you know if you're an international viewer then that means blah 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 uh, rather than just saying oh it's a scottish higher two paper or, or whatever um but um yeah like i, I tried to, to signpost it very clearly i think that's one way to avoid people being frustrated by either being spectacularly overqualified for a stream or underqualified for a stream um but yeah it is tough i think you have to pick a, a certain i don't know if you do this but I, I basically pick a baseline of i'm going to explain things to this level anything below that level i am going to assume you already know like i'm going to assume you know uh what a derivative is for the most part and uh, for the like coding streams i don't but like i'm certainly not going to explain how the addition is commutative like right, right, right. you know like i mean how, how do you approach that um so mine are uh i'm very transparent about it i think that you have to when you're in this business you have to accept that like edu like edu like self-educating which is what i do because i'm not affiliated with the university or anything like that like i'm a graduate student at a university i teach at that university but they have nothing to do with my stream you know it's yeah. completely all self-driven and uh because people are self-learning on my channel, I have to kind of come to grips with the fact that it depends on if they're in the mood to. 
you know? Yeah. And I could just sit here and do question and answers and, and do things like that. And, and I, and I would have better viewership and I, I would probably be more interesting to watch. But at the same time, like, I don't want anybody to get the misconception that that's how physics works, you know, because I don't like there's a balance in physics where you have to sit down and do rigor. And then there's a balance in physics where you can actually kind of be excited and explore different concepts, bef- you know, outside of the rigor. So hmm. for me, it's um, I have to have some sort of mathematical physics rigor in my lessons. And I try to be very transparent about what level it's going to be. Uh, before I start. So like uh, building streams, there's something we do on Sundays where we try to build physics demonstrations and, and things like that. And uh, I always try to keep them at more like an introductory physics level where because I know that a lot more people are going to be interested in them with uh, who are like engineers or, um, you know, some someone re- or computer science or something like that. Uh, and then Wednesdays, I, I, I'm a little bit more uh, open to doing some either, you know, third or fourth year student or graduate level physics uh and and that's something that i'll just be very i'll just try to be very transparent about and say up front uh this sunday was the first time i ever did a three level education uh a three level lecture where i i did conservation of momentum and conservation of energy and for each of those i did what you would see in intro what you would see in a mechanics class like a third second or third year and then what you would see in a quantum mechanics class like fourth year or third year Oh, okay so i did one of those that was the first time i ever tried that but i also tried to be very transparent that like if you're a second year graduate if you're a second year undergraduate you probably won't understand the quantum mechanic thing and that's so okay I love that as, a, as a format that's fantastic you should definitely do more of those like yeah that's it's, great it's kind of difficult because you need to have you need to know exactly where to look for all three levels yeah and you need to connect them like for the conservation of momentum it was I knew enough about it where I could, at the end of each of them, I could get to a DP over DT equals zero. You know what I mean? Like that's something I had to get to at the end of each of these things. And it's hard to find a connection for all three levels of of things. But I do plan to do more of them for sure. Um, That's cool. But it's difficult. And then, again, those those lessons are a bit longer. Uh, And it's, again, something I just sort of had to come to grips with, like, you know. So you have to be in the mood for it and a lot of people just won't be in the mood for it so <laughs> that's another reason why i have to put things on youtube because then people will be like well i'm in the mood now yeah 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 <laughs> um okay so inversion size says simon how do you feel about being my 69th follower on twitch then he nice. says nice all right. Yeah. <laughs> Simon agrees. It is nice. So uh, Luna with socks. Good to see you, Luna. Uh, says, hi, Simon. Have you thought about starting a second channel? Like uh, maybe like an errata, maybe? Like maybe like a Simon oh. Clark errata or something? How many, how many channels have I even started at this point? There's the main channel. There was the Oxblog. Well, there still is the Oxblog channel, but I'm not part of it anymore. Uh, which was sort of vlogs from Oxford students. There's Spongy and Electric, which is the uh, me and my friend Dan. <laughs> yeah, that was... So a lot of people don't know the story behind that name. So it's my friend Dan and I, we do a podcast together called The Wikicast, but it's also just if and when we're allowed to meet up again, we're going to be doing more in-person videos, um, as we have been meaning to do for ages, but then the pandemic really put paid to him. But yeah, we were, we were singing in a choir once, and our choir director, Michael, who's one of my best mates, just said, can you make it more spongy and electric you know what i mean <laughs> it was like the worst direction we'd ever been given and so we called the channel that um and then nice. then there's simon clark errata and which is largely warhammer but there's also occasional like stream highlights and stuff like that and then there's simon clark uh, concentrated clark which is shorts but i haven't uploaded anything there for a while that was more just an experiment to see how sh- viable shorts might be um, and then eventually, there actually is already a Planet Factory channel, but I need to make content for it. So yeah, there are a few channels already. <laughs> already. That actually is the only original content I make on YouTube is shorts. Um, hmm. I like the I like the format of having a uh, of having like a, a sixty seconds to explain something difficult. Yeah. So like my last one I did uh, yesterday, I think, was um, what is a myron a fermion. Uh, and it's like 60 seconds to describe a, 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 a Myron, a Fermion field. Like, <laughs> how good can you do? <laughs> it's yeah. Like, it's fun to me because it's like, I, it's just a different format. And it's like, if someone, it's something that I think you don't need to be in the mood for. So like, you can, yeah. uh, you don't, you, you just be like, you know, I'm kind of curious about that. I don't feel like learning a bunch of quantum field theory, but I am kind of curious to see what a Myron, a Fermion is. So you can just watch it 60 seconds. Y- y- everybody has time for a 30 second video, yeah, you yeah. know? 
Like it's it's ideal toilet watching content. You sit down on your phone <laughs> yeah. and you're like, hey, I got time. Sixty seconds. <laughs> uh very good. So I, I, I suggest uh I the only one I was aware of was the Simon Clark Arata. Uh, I highly suggest following that. Um but yeah, there's some other ones to follow as well. There are some other ones and pl- hopefully Planet Factory would be um That sounds exciting would be this yeah. summer, which yeah. is oh, just we get need to get uh compressed uh, like uh, compressible fluid advection working. We've had incompressible working now, but it's oh, getting the compressible side of things working is hard, it <laughs> turns out. Um, so Math Problem Solving Online had asked this question, which I think is really good. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of like for an everyday person uh, okay. like myself to know, uh, how, how, do you conf- how do we confirm global warming for ourselves? Like, how can I just say, like, it's true because this and that's, like, the believable sound bite that I can get behind? So this this kind of d- drills to the heart of why it is such a difficult subject to talk to people about. Because we as humans are uniquely bad at perceiving it, um, at perceiving climate change. Because climate change is this field that, in order to understand it, you have to have measurements that are separated in large distances in space and large distances in time. Like looking at just a local field is not really useful. There will be some local fields if you look at them over a long period of time, a long enough period of time that will be useful. Um, like for example, the Central England time uh, temperature time series that's been going back for oh god, like two hundred and fifty years now. I think that's one example of that. This location, the temperature has risen, or the uh, date that Japanese uh, cherry blossom blooms. Uh, you know, that's been steadily getting earlier and earlier. The problem is those signals themselves are not indicative necessarily of climate change. They are, um, they don't have the appropriate statistical weight to make that kind of conclusion. And it's frustrating because basically in order to believe that this is a real thing, you have to put your trust in scientific process. You have to put your trust in the idea that you can take measurements over millennia via proxies and you can gather data over the entire surface of the planet and it's only when you do that that you actually do get this really strong signal in but in terms of like an individual measurement that you yourself can make the only way that you could probably do it as an individual would just be to measure the concentration of carbon dioxide and that on like the most fundamental level is the problem that it is this gas that blocks long wavelengths of light from leaving the earth uh, and if you accept that as a basic fact, then a measurement of CO2 at two different times, because over the course of like my parents' lifetime, uh, I actually need to look this up, what, what the PPM was when like my parents were born, because um, it's going to be shockingly low. But the fact that the, it has changed in concentration by from the pre-industrial period uh, by uh, what, what, like f- nearly 40% now, I think, is... Uh, it, it, it is just shocking and and when that of course is again though just like a first level problem like because just because the co2 concentration is increasing naively you'd expect the temperature to increase but there are so many other feedbacks that take place like what if that causes enhanced convection in the tropics that leads to more clouds forming which leads to more radiation being reflected to space which then leads to a negative feedback like it, it is unfortunately a problem that is ugh, I've got to try and remember the name of it. I think it's called an impossible problem. That humans are uniquely predisposed to be incapable of solving. So unfortunately, there is no one simple test you can do. But that is the nature of the problem. That's why it's such a hard thing to convince people of. Uh, so math, uh, math online problem solving uh, <clears throat> said there's a little bit more to the question. So let me uh, let me ask oh, right. the, uh, a second half of that. Um, how much of your uh, uh, is it covered thoroughly in the book? climate change so the book, uh yeah the book talks about um the discovery of climate change it's not so much a book about this is what we're going to do about it there is like a small section at the end that is this is the prognosis and you know this is what we need to do if we want to avoid that but that's not what the book is about the book is very much that section of the book is about you know deriving the concepts of radiative physics and people discovering that actually in the past the climate could change and has changed and those changes were linked to carbon and in the present day we have seen these changes and um you know ascribing those changes to humans specifically 
Uh, and then another uh, member, uh, another well, mod and a longtime friend of the stream, Justin, says on a recent Sean Carroll podcast with Julia Galef, um, mm-hmm. <coughs> she basically said that uh, that belief in global warming due to human activity diverges as their science intelligence increases. Is that something that you're familiar with? Based on political beliefs. That's interesting because you, uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to work out if that means as like scientific intelligence or sort of literacy increases, is there like a bifurcation in how much you believe in it? Or is it, you know, the people who are not, I, I, that's how I'm reading that. It's like there's a bifurcation in belief. That's um, interesting. I'd not come across that one. Um, I think that if, if I were to try and explain that, it's because you could argue there is evidence for both the supporting the hypothesis and disproving the hypothesis. Yeah, so there you go. Well, it, it, yeah, if people get smarter, they can rationalize what they want to hear. So, you know, you can say, oh yeah, but there's this positive, this negative feedback of um, yeah. more clouds being generated in the tropics. But like, that's why uh, it, it's the whole phrase, like a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like it, it, it's like yes, okay, that is a factor. But what you now need to understand is like the the context of that result and um, how that fits into all of the other feedbacks that have taken place. Um, like th- this is why I, I I've talked about this a couple of times recently. But like I I think good science communication is awareness of a topic, understanding of a topic, and then like the literacy of that topic. Because a smart person can be aware that that is a thing and even understand the physics of how that works. But you don't really under, you don't have a full understanding until you have an understanding of that fact and its surroundings in academia. Um, that's when you truly actually know a lot about a, a field. And the people who do know a lot about a field will tell you that that is one feedback amongst many and has been studied several times and then you get into the weeds of like the people who have done those kinds of studies finding those results are typically funded by heartland institute and fossil fuel interests and then you get into whole you know um uh, uh oh jesus what's the name of the Oreskes book uh, merchants of doubt that's the one um but yeah for each expert there is an equal and opposite expert uh, and this is the problem i think with um i was invited to speak at a debate once that was uh, this house believes that we have had enough of experts, which I don't think is true. I think we've had enough of consensus. Yeah. As like people online, we That's don't. Really we no longer a- appeal to consensus because like, oh, we know ninety-seven percent of scientists. It's probably almost. I, I don't know, and I know that figure is itself itself intensely debated, but <laughs> you know, f- probably far higher than that. Believe in the, the anthropogenic global warming, and yet there will be people who say yes, but there are experts who believe that it isn't and i'm going to believe those experts because it confirms this belief that i already had whereas i think previously when we didn't all have access to individual information feeds about somebody's stream of consciousness we were happy to accept the consensus as arrived on by a panel of experts Uh, that was very depressing sorry (laughs) (laughs) no it's good it's good uh well that's kind of goes into our next question is mainstream marketing in in divorce with scientific activity so like uh you you know you mentioned a little bit about the uh you know the um you know fossil fuel industry like is that something that you find that's like constantly conflicting with what you're trying to do uh not so much now um i feel like that was more the case of it was science versus fossil fuel companies in like the 80s and 90s. I think as the evidence has become more and more incontrovertible, it's become untenable for them to have explicitly anti the science positions. What's more the case now is just greenwashing uh, with people you know, co- corporations saying this issue is important to us and that's why we've made this change, not telling you that that change is probably a woefully insignificant compared to the overall impact they have, but also fits into this broader pattern of exploiting the natural world for commercial profit. And, you know, it fails to address uh, the fundamental problem at the moment is that all of the acti- all this activism from companies kind of fails to address the fundamental problem that capitalism is not good for the environment because <laughs> It's an it's what it's what they call a negative externality of that's a thing a bad thing that will happen but it happens outside our economic system so we're not going to concern ourselves with it, um, and it, depending on who you read and what you believe you kind of need to get rid of 
certainly like modern capitalism in order to have a, a chance at, at saving the planet. There are plenty of people who would disagree with that, but I, I feel like that's what the, in, in as much as mainstream marketing diverges with the reality of kind of the severity of our situation, that's what the problem is. It's like mainstream marketing is fundamentally designed to raise money for X interest that already has capital. Sure. And that interest has a very much a vested interest in keeping its capital, whether that, it, you know, whatever that may be. And, and, and almost always will tie itself via directly or via how many other corporations to some fossilized carbon in the ground. And that's the problem. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so uh, we're going to go a little bit faster here. We still have 12 questions, so we'll, we'll hit them kind of quickly. Sure. Um, on a side, speed round. Yeah, speed round. So Quim King says, on a side note, has Simon seen the Ast Astart Astartes project? Astartes. Astartes yeah. project? Uh, if, you ever, if you've ever had any interaction with Warhammer, you should watch Astartes. It's really? A, it's a fan film. It's about a, uh, 15 minutes long, I think, in total. Maybe a little oh, longer. Really? Um that's made by a single man and it is better than anything games workshop has ever produced it's <laughs> it is the best 3d oh, animation no. i think i've ever seen it's it's wow. it's everything about it from lore accuracy to rendering to the animation to the story is so impressive uh it's one of my favorite things on the internet i support the guy on patreon although he has now been uh, hired by games workshop to make animations for them nice. so nice happy ending for him actually yeah Hope that works. I hope that works to his advantage. Um, <clears throat> calamity, uh, calamity. Excuse me. Calamity cast says you've mentioned several times how climate change last winter negated the Nina current. Uh, what is your prediction of how that will react this summer? Yeah. So, so basically, previously, when you look at um, the record temperatures, uh, which would which were 2016, uh, the reason that the world temperature was so high was because it coincided with a strong El Nino event. So the Pacific was a lot warmer than normal. And what I noted was that last year, we were in a La Nina phase, which is the opposite. The Pacific was cooler than normal. And um, even with that, we were basically as warm as 2016. Oh, wow. Like, so like the, the kind of influence of humans has now grown over the past five years to kind of negate the, the largest swing in natural variability that we have on the planet. Um, whereas now we're going to climb out of a La Nina phase at some point this year. I think we're still negative uh, index. Um, but you know what's gonna what's it gonna look like in terms of temperature anomaly when you have an, another El Nino phase combined with those additional years of warming? It's gonna be a record-breaking temp you know temperature. I have no doubt. Um, in terms of how bad it will be, I I couldn't give you a number honestly. Um, I El Nino is one of these systems that I understand enough to talk about it, but I have not certainly not done any research on it myself. Um, I would need to go away and probably spend a couple of years researching it before I could give you like a quantitative prediction. Sure. But yeah, it's almost certainly if we come out of an El Nino phase, uh, sorry, if we come out of the La Nina going into a neutral or El Nino phase, it's probably going to be a temperature record set. If not this year, then next year. Nice. Okay. It's that bad, but like not, not potential not nice, civilization. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So um, the next one is from Airsofter. Uh, it says, what areas of physics math do you find the most elegant? And may S I remind you, you are now working through quantum field theory. So I was, I, and Airsoft uh, has the world's biggest hard on for QFT. And I feel like <laughs> I have to say, I did have a moment the other day when I, I reached, you, you know, you established the field for the vacuum and then you're yep. like, oh, but what if we introduce a source function? Yep. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. Yep. This is like, I definitely had that um, that moment with QFT. I think the, the competitor to that would be um, when you're first introduced to four vectors and the idea of Lorentz invariance. Yep. Um, that's so, so cool. Yeah. Um, that and um when you were introduced to maxwell's equations and being able to you know just putting all of these phenomena into such a simple form and you could you know put it down into one equation when you it's just what the um uh, second order derivative of the uh energy tensor right like it's you could put it all into one form and it's just like it's one of those kind of sit back and be like 
man, that's 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 really tight. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I feel like as Justin's saying, they're kind of QFT really, but like yeah, I think I think it's just... with an honourable mention to to relativity uh, yeah. to, to general rel. <laughs> uh very good. I totally agree. I, I I mean, there's there's so many cool things about the the special relativity and the way it works with quantum mechanics to just come together nicely into a quantum field theory is so good i feel like i didn't really like special rel when we first encountered it which was basically just like one dimensional lorentz transformations uh -huh. you know like it was when you put it into four vector form okay sure that it really i, I really liked and I, I had a moment of realizing like i think it was kind of a callback to my high school moment really but i remember telling my tutor a guy called garrett cotter i was like I realized that the special rel is actually really easy. And he was like, yeah, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically just learn four vectors and, you know, applying Lorentz transforms and you're fine. <laughs> like... uh, all right. So Wardogham says, uh, Simon, what are some of the methods for measuring greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? Right. So this is, uh, this is actually something I've never taken a measurement myself, and I feel like maybe I should because I, that, that that would be an interesting topic. Um, so I know that the way that Charles Keeling did it, um, which was who was uh, not the first person to measure CO two in the atmosphere, but certainly the first person to do it continuously and very accurately, um, would be to pump. Is it liquid? You basically take an air sample, and I think you pump liquid nitrogen into it, and you effectively cause the um, carbonic acid which is co2 um you, you you cause that to condense in liquid form and then for a given volume of air you can measure how much acid has come out and from that imply a mass of carbon dioxide using the molar you know then using the molar mass you can imply a density of molecules within your air sample um i don't know of other ways of doing it i'm sure that there are far more sophisticated ways of doing it now um because that's almost certainly very time consuming and he would do a couple of measurements a day presumably there's some way of doing like a kind of mass spectroscopy on it but i guess that would kind of just isolate the mm, yeah i don't know other, other than that method i don't know of any others i don't think uh so samwise says i gather this is getting in <laughs> getting to end so physics oh why is seven your favorite number and why is it simon's so my introduction <laughs> to the whole tts and seven thing was on your stream i didn't even know that was a thing and then i got introduced to it on your stream and i thought it was hilarious and then i found out that it was like a, a thing and i was just late to the party but the first time i heard that i i laughed for a while um and uh yeah so uh why is it your favorite number? Uh, well, hang on, it's, it's right here in my set. Uh, if I balance <laughs> it on my finger. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a nice, I, I have a thing for prime numbers anyway. Like, they're pretty cool. But go. also like, it's, I don't know. There's something about the, the actual Roman character for seven that's very simple, but it's kind of alien at the same time. Sure. Like, yeah, it's, it's. I think it's quite a pleasing number to write. It has some pleasing properties, but mostly it's the fact that it comes from text to speech. And it remind. Whenever I see a seven now, I think <laughs> of my community, which is wonderful. When you write a seven with a pe with a pen or a pencil, do you cross it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That uh, sevens like that and Zs. Sorry, yep. Zs. Yep. Uh, with a with a bar for sure. Definitely. Uh, and then now any H that I write has one too apparently that i have to stop doing sometimes like, <laughs> this usually means something different so <laughs> it's like you're writing v with a h bar it just looks like a t the bar on the t just goes through everything mm -hmm. <laughs> uh all right very good so dominic uh dominic uh Wellimon says uh simon sorry if i i sorry i butchered your name i'm sure i did uh who is who is on your list of top scientists you'd like to talk to or interview Oh, Ooh, let's lump this. Hell. Let's lump this with a later one that says, uh, "Who would you both like to collaborate with most?" <laughs> um, wow, who would I? I mean, in 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 terms of people who are living or dead, I would a hundred percent choose um, James Clerk Maxwell and Michael Faraday. I think they're both fascinating, like individuals who I would just. Um, they're, they're both kind of complete polar opposites in a sense. Um, one of the things that stuck with me from Blundell's book as well is the fact that apparently Maxwell was just like a really swell guy. Like he played guitar and wrote poetry and loved his dog. 
Like, and that enamored me to him way, way more than like how elegant his theories were. Um, in terms of people who are alive now, because the, th the difference is I have been out of atmospheric science for so long now that. Do you feel like you're out of it? I feel like I am. I feel like, well, the problem is as well that like what I did, uh, stratosphere troposphere coupling was kind of like a nub on the tree of knowledge. Like it didn't connect to a huge number of other fields. Um, and it, it was something that I already knew the people who, like my supervisor was the guy who wrote the paper on this being a thing, basically. So it's like, oh, cool. Okay. Well, when I, uh, when I go to academic conferences, I found it difficult to go to other atmospheric sessions and actually engage with what was going on. Like, because I didn't have that depth of knowledge, uh, but the same a more general synoptic scale meteorologist would have. Um, what I actually found really interesting was going to the, um, the the panels and sessions on other planets. Like when, uh, was it Cassini? I think there was one on Cassini data that I went to in Vienna and just sitting in the back and being like, I don't know what any of these acronyms mean, but like this science <laughs> is cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would really struggle to name people that I would want to collaborate with just because I feel like the only atmospheric scientist that I would name would be Susan Solomon because the last time I met her, I totally didn't clock that it was her and I made an absolute ass out of myself. Uh, <laughs> and oh, she no. she's like a very big deal. Oh, um, no. But like, yeah, other than her, there is some, this Tim Lenton in X2 who I never got a chance to do a video with. He, he specializes in uh, Gaia 2.0. So like this, the, this idea of interconnectedness between earth systems and biological systems. And um, I think he'd make for a really interesting video. And I just never got a chance to do that, uh, you know, with him. What about you? I feel like you're gonna have a better answer. I like. I would like to probably if I like a. Uh, so obviously I like this. Like I like collaborating with you, and I I collaborated with uh uh um on Twitch we did uh one a little bit back. I'm new to collaborations. I've only done a few of hmm. them, but we did. Uh, I did one with a good friend, uh, Neuro Foyer, who also streams on Twitch, and we talked about genius, and that was a lot of fun. About like it was a different. You know, he was a neuroscientist who works uh with the Biden administration, um hmm. on COVID, and he's uh. We had a lot to talk about about uh, that, which was really good. Uh, I also did a collaboration with uh, Kyle Cabasaris, who's all uh, streams as Astrono Misfit on Twitch, and uh, it was really good. Uh, it was fun to that that. But other than that, I've only done uh, maybe one or two other streams with people, you know. So um, I haven't had a lot of opportunities. So this is a lot of fun for me. And uh, oh, likewise, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but if I had to pick someone who I would absolutely like, you know, it'd be a dream. It would probably be someone who's older. Um, like uh maybe uh um maybe someone like cn yang or uh steven uh weinberg um oh, yeah. some someone who has a lot because i'm not going to be asking them things like uh you know like if i had i would be terrified to have someone like Nima or Kani Hamad on because I'd be terrified to ask something that I should probably know the answer to. So I'd want to talk about stories, you know, about their life, about their what they did, about, you know, different things, what the what the atmosphere was like in the seventies and the sixties yeah, for yeah. like for for um particle physics when it was like wildly enthusiastic. Um or like even like what the eighties were like for quantum computing when it was like the end of the eighties when it was like first being dreamt up, you know, and things like that in the nineties. That'd be a fun conversation to have. So I'd be nervous to have like someone like Neymar <laughs> Kani Hamad because like I'd be like you know he's he's still young he's still in his 40s so he's still like you know he would you know I'd want to ask him physics questions but I'd be terrified <laughs> about whatever I could ask him you know I'd be like and he has so much good stories but at the same time I'd be just I'd be terrified uh hmm. so maybe it's, it's, like it's like, like imposter that, yeah. syndrome intensified like I yeah, get imposter yeah. syndrome at the best of times <laughs> Uh, and then, okay, so let's, let's, uh, keep moving. Uh, we're going to go super, we have five questions left, so we're going to go really fast, uh, because mm -hmm. I want to start this game. Uh, I don't want to keep you too long. Let's see. So Captain Reed said, Simon, why was your trip to Yagcon not your favorite? And where can I send <laughs> my, t my, my, uh, where can I send my jars of tears? Yeah. Okay. Yagcon in retrospect was probably the coolest one, but that was, uh, that was an in such an interesting experience because it was the first time I met Captain Reed and I met um, uh, like a whole load of people from the community. Um, that was really, really fun. But it was also in this uh, <laughs> non-air conditioned warehouse in Bristol that was uh, unbelievable. <laughs> if we were cattle, 
the people who ran it would have been like prosecuted, sent straight to jail for how how hot the temperature was. It was <laughs> unbel unbelievable, but it was very very cool. Uh, it was a very unique atmosphere of just these people who were super enthusiastic about the Elks Cast like community and you know get, getting to watch stuff that you'd normally watch on Twitch live. That was very very fun. But uh, yeah, I think it was very different to, to TwitchCon. I think TwitchCon was a bit more overwhelmingly different, whereas like Yogcon was very. Uh, it was, it was kind of like a uni house party where you know most of the people. <laughs> sure. it, very very hot and very cool and, and like, you know, very, very fun to be there. But like, it's like right. comparing that with going to, I don't know, like a show in the West End. It's a very different vibe. I enjoyed them both in very different ways. <laughs> Uh, so Inversion and Tech have some nice things to say. Uh, so Inversion says, Simon, our video, or Simon, your videos are awesome. Your Twitch is a joy to watch, and you've helped so many people uh, get started, um, <clears throat> including himself, Sam, Ed, uh, and probably more. Would you please give yourself some credit? Tech follows that up with, Simon, I've heard you do not give yourself credit. <laughs> give yourself credit, please. <laughs> Thanks. Also, I, uh, Inversion, yeah. do not blame me for you starting to stream. When, when, you, when you are, like, give it a couple of months and you hate this. Don't, don't blame this on me, okay? <laughs> uh, very good. Very good. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Calamity Cost says we have two more questions about book publishing. Considering that Amazon has self-publishing tools, what made you go with an established publisher? So the way that that worked was I had this concept for a book kind of rattling around my head. And then the publisher just, um, well, my editor rather at the publishing house contacted me and just said, would you like to come in? And, you know, would you be interested in doing uh, a book with us? And I think um, if I'm honest, a large part of that was the re why I said yes was the legitimacy of being published by a publishing house. I think that there is nothing wrong with self-publishing at all but I think when I had in my mind's eye of I want to be a science communicator and one of those things that I, I always wanted to do was to write a book I always had this image of it being professionally printed and distributed um, and so I think that was partly why and I think the other reason was that it is um, potentially so much larger reach you know but you, you can self-publish and you know promote it online and everything like that but you know, that doesn't compare to getting a front and center display in Barnes and Noble or Waterstones. Um, like, you, you, and that was something that they were on the call to me and said, you know, oh yeah, Waterstones are really interested in like, you know, doing displays for this. And like, there's no way I would have been able to get that on my own. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that, that was why I, I went with a, a, a publishing house because it, it's just, a it's a very different experience and it's very different you know it's i think otherwise it would have been more similar really to writing writing a video and making a video it's yeah. just a sure. one-man band and I, I i kind of wanted to try that more intense shared experience of i do this but then other people come in and do the artwork and other people do the the copy and the advertising and all that kind of stuff <clears throat> Um. <laughs> uh, and then our last yeah. question. Well, if we from... if we do a launch party, yeah. Captain Reed in America, a hundred percent, we will we will hundred percent do that. <laughs> um. Oh, I forgot to disable that. Boring math professor. I will do. Listen, I owe tropical twenty five push up or sit ups. I owe you twenty five sit ups now, and I owe Tyrion twenty push ups. I will do all of those on Friday during our study stream. Remind me, because we had an uncapped. I did this thing where I, I told them that if they did something, I would do an uncapped workout on my stream so i gave channel points where i do like you do 20 20 push-ups 25 sit-ups or planks 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 and i said <laughs> that uh you could uh i it was on cap like they just do it and i would just keep going until un up until a certain limit where i i couldn't take anymore and <laughs> i think they all forgot because <laughs> nobody cashed anything in and i was like all right oh no Thank now you're you. reaping that that yeah. particular crop so now i'm doing it now so then i i put cap on it now <laughs> <laughs> um so justin uh justin says our final question doesn't uh does an understanding of climate physics benefit you in a direct way in navigating real life Ooh, um, I think, well, there's two answers to that question. I think there's, on the one hand, it, can, it, it means that I am aware, I'm far more aware when I take actions of how that's going to influence my future, indirectly, obviously, like by, um, do I want to get into Bitcoin mining? No, because that's a huge sink of like, you know, a cause of carbon emissions. Uh, do I want to eat meat? No, because that's a huge cause of carbon emissions. Like, uh, you know, it, it influences my decisions in real life, for sure. 
on a more banal level, there is one example of, <laughs> of where understanding this stuff does make a difference. And it's when you are going camping or if, or if you want to have like a window open when you're sleeping and you're like, what if it's going to be cold tonight? And then like, you can look up and if you see clouds, ah, it's going to be quite warm tonight. Whereas if there's no clouds, there's, there's less radiation being trapped by the water vapor. So yes. it's going to be colder. So like, I, and I remember that being on summer camp with scouts once and being like, oh, it's nice clouds. And this is the night when we're out in our bivouacs and sleeping bags. This is, this is bad. Like, <laughs> but like being forewarned about nighttime temperatures is like a tiny little benefit, but it's, it's very, very practical. <laughs> I imagine that like what someone envisions when they think of a climate physicist and like a daily like use is they would just look at the sky, look at the sun and be like, it is exactly 1223 in the afternoon. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, something like that. And like exactly by the, by the cloud formation, I can tell that it is, it is 70, 76 degrees and the, the sky is, you know. The if you have a large enough view, you can normally tell like, you know, oh, there, there's a weather front that's coming in from that side, or like, you know, it. it, it the problem is predicting weather is uh, turns out pretty hard, and <laughs> like, e even if you know all the equations in your mind, it's actually far more valuable just to be able to read the landscape. I think. Of, um, although it does have other benefits, I suppose, like when you see temperature inversions happening and like smog being trapped in a city or mist being trapped in a valley, like it's very. It, it's like how Feynman talked about when you understand the physics and the science of something, it doesn't replace the beauty, it enhances it. And I do yeah. think that's true. It enhances your appreciation of the natural world. <laughs> Coopsie, yes, I was, it was, it was the dirty Fahrenheit. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, or, everybody. Uh, unless you, or, or if you work in Kelvin as a that's true scientist. That's true, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Calvin would be that'd be all right that'd be perfectly fine um all right well that's the end of the Q&A session sorry we we did have to cap the uh, Q&A session um uh, but thank you all for the questions that was very good now comes us being dominated by Twitch chat <laughs> no 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 we got this we got yeah sorry positivity yeah, positivity yeah, okay so <laughs> let's see how this will work um let me see okay good so far good so far good so far looks good um okay so i haven't I, I don't how how is this gonna work okay so <clears throat> let me explain the rules and how we play on my channel so uh i we play with a thing called click maps so let me start that and what you should see is if if i start the click maps um you should see and of course it's being weird uh, there we go uh if i start the click maps what you will see is a a, a like a white hue around the screen and you can begin clicking on the screen. So I've started it now. Go ahead and click anywhere on the screen. Uh, if you are at a PC, so you have to be sitting at a PC, you know, and oh, you yeah. can start clicking at the screen. And then what will happen is it will show up on the actual, uh, it will show up on the screen, right? So <laughs> my users like to click my face. Um, it's just kind of a normal thing. I, and everybody's clicking my face. All right, so uh, what happens is, is this is your vote. And, and you can vote as many times as you want. And, and as, if you're sitting at a, at a computer and have a mouse in your hand, you can click to your heart's content. And, no uh, auto clickers. I know my audience well enough. We're going to have no <laughs> auto clickers. There please. you go. And now, and I can see how many clicks and stuff it is and stuff. So there's 34 users and three, 38 users and 300 clicks. So then uh, now you're they're clicking your face as well. So it's it's uh, it's it. They're, they're my chat's quite rude. Like I'll have a full. I'll have like my normal view, and they'll just start clicking on my nose. See how smaller my bubble is? It's because mine is trying to click on the nose itself. Like they just like to <laughs> click on my nose. And it's, it's well, obviously mine's gonna be bigger because I've got a bigger nose. Disheartening. Uh. Um. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So this is how you vote. And what we'll do is we'll play a couple rounds, and then I can stop this and make it go away. And what we'll do is we'll play a couple rounds. And the idea is we're going to play Country Streak, okay? And we'll play best out of three. And the idea is uh, if si – so Simon and I will go first. And we will have to guess the country that we are in. And there's no moving. You can't move the around. So you just have to look around. Okay. You can move the camera. Like I can switch around, pan, zoom, things like that. But I can't walk forward, walk backwards, anything like that. Now, after – um, after we take our turn, then it will be your turn and you will have to do the same thing. So what will happen is you'll have one minute to look one minute to click on the full map. 
And then after a minute, I will zoom into the middle of the bubble and you'll have another minute to click on a smaller portion of the map. So okay. you really have to use a hive mind for this because, you know, if someone says, you know, it's in it's in Europe, you know, then you do you want to make sure that everybody goes to Europe and not like it's split because eventually I have to pick the largest bubble and zoom into that country. And then you have a minute to pick out of that country where you think it is. So. You'll get three minutes per country or per map each one, and uh, Simon and I will probably take less than that because three minutes is a long time for two people who can talk. Um, and then uh, the person with the highest streak will win the round, and uh, we'll go into uh, best out of three. Whoever wins that. So, so um, if, if, how how like specific? If if for example, like I don't know, they say Italy and it's actually San Marino. Like, are we counting that as a as a loss? Uh, it has is, to be very specifically the San right Marino, country. Is San Marino in Italy? It's, it's next to. Italy. It's next to Italy. Is it like one of the small? I, see, this is, now I'm now yeah. I feel like I'm gonna weigh us down, Simon. I'm so sorry <laughs> going in. Like, I, I'm also, so Simon, sorry. we used to rule the world. You should be pretty clued up on countries. I didn't personally. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. <laughs> um. So yeah. So it has to be in the country. It has to be actual country. And like they got Malta, Simon. They got Malta. Um, oh so no, I have been to Malta, so I hope I, 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 if we, that happens to us, we should be fine. Ah, chat, you should be nervous. I think this is uh, now. Last time we did this, I tied. Uh, it, I also happened to get the United States twice in a row for the first two countries, and they got like Malta and like Australia. <laughs> but, oh wow! Okay. But, so then we tied. We got two. So this is this is. Uh, we'll see who wins. I don't. I don't think I I only beat them in one thing, one challenge, and that was a it was a hard challenge. Um, okay, so let's do where's country streak? There's streaks. Let's do country streak. So Simon and I will play first. Okay. <laughs> it says your best streak too. Oh man, you gotta rub it in. Okay. Uh, so we're <laughs> first, and uh, let's see here. So, uh, right, so the first thing to the check stream. is the sun. The sun is in the northern hemisphere, so I think we're in the south. Right, northern hemisphere. No, that's Wait, how can you tell? Oh, yes, there is a compass direction. Yeah. yeah, so that's south. So we're in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. And then let's see. So we have a two-lane road. This looks like America. Oh, no. Can you zoom in on the text? Yeah, it's something no. Eastern European. No, that's that's Cyrillic. So that's going to be um, Russia or an ex-Soviet state. What? How do you know that? This? Uh, I'm trying to. I can't read Cyrillic, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> oh no! What? I mean, Russia would be like the most. Can you zoom it? There's, there's like some more text on the left. Go, go more to the left. <clears throat> uh oh, hold on. Get out of here. This left or like left, left? Oh left, uh, no, left. a little bit more, a little bit more. I was just wondering if that was like a name of a. Uh, so let's see here. Oh, there, there we go. Big text. What do you, oh, what, do you what do you reckon with that? I mean, if I had to Francisco, (laughs) I I mean, like statistically, Russia, it's the largest place that 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 uses that alphabet. But uh, that would be a guess. What do you think is Romax, or is it Chromax? I don't. Uh, A place that sells cement mixes, from the looks of things. (laughs) Uh, All right, so doesn't tell us very much. So we're going with there's no cars or anything. What's this way? A lot of fields. A lot of nothing. A lot of nothing. Okay, so let's just go with Russia. I trust you. I mean, it could be somewhere else, like around the Caucasus. Um, this is mm. why I got Simon here. This is literally why I brought Simon on the stream. <laughs> Can I we just, have a look, one more look at that text on the side of that building? I just want to see if there's like a... Because if there's a website, if it's like .ru, oh, then yeah, that will yeah, mean yeah. we're in Russia. Um, uh, I don't see anything. There's a phone number. Can you call 89371771220? <laughs> Please no one call that phone number. Uh, I don't recognize any words here that could be countries. Yeah, I don't think so either. It, it could be somewhere like Ukraine. I think Belarus uses the same alphabet. Okay, let's let's say Russia. That's okay. statistically it's the sensible, you know, Statistical cho- uh, statistical choice. Let's go. Okay, very good. We got it. <clears throat> yeah. We're on to round Okay, we're on two. a roll. All right. Remember how we said three minutes will probably be uh, too long? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then again, uh, 
Asian paints? Gaston right. Battery. Judging by the alphabet, is that Gujarati? A what is that? I think it might be India. Sounds in the south. Sounds in the south? Is that right or is that north? Uh, right? Yeah, just. Yeah, so it's pretty close to the equator. Oh, um, yeah, sorry, so just... it's probably, yeah, okay, good. I mean, it, it could be, but it could be Bangladesh. Um, I think it's India, just sort of, again, statistically. So to, yeah, Bangladesh is pretty small. One of my peers and group members and good friends is from Bangladesh. Actually, oh. he's in Bangladesh right now. Ah, Seven that up. is a Bangladeshi flag, wasn't it? Go back a little bit. The 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 um red dot on a green background. This is that not is this Bangladeshi flag? I don't know. I mean Bangladesh is a um red flag with a sorry, green flag with a red circle, I'm pretty sure. So that's a good uh, look at and the Google uh, car the Google car is red and green. Well, I mean Are they normally? I'm oh, sure, red, I'm not green, sure, and yellow. I'm not sure how much that tells us. Then again, I look at the Google. I look at the Google indicator, and I'm like, okay, so it's just the Google. Can, can logo. you zoom in on that road sign? That, um... Yeah. Uh, let's see here. This one, maybe right here. Yeah, that's the one. Um... Oh yeah, look at the, the. There's the green circle with the red dot again. I bet you you're right. I bet you it's Bangladesh. Yeah, but I could just be overcomplicating this. I don't know what the flag is, so. It's not an idiotic guess. No, not I at think. all. Uh, it's either India or Bangladesh. I'm gonna put go out on a limb here, and I reckon that might be Bangladesh. I Unless wish. there is a giant sign somewhere we've missed that says this is India, <laughs> which is you know a possibility. People will be like you in chat will just be like you idiots. <laughs> I have no um, idea. I think you're right though. I think it's Bangladesh. With my okay, shoot all for my the moon. knowledge, all my knowledge let, let, of this. Let's try it. Look, it even has the symbol right there. Let's go. Oh, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at oh. that. Yeah. I, I mean, like, there was – I contributed. Uh, All right. So <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to this one. Oh, come on. No what? signs. Just a house. Let's zoom in their window and see if we can see who's inside. Uh, I don't see anybody. Okay. Let's 18. See. So they use a Western numerical alphabet. Cool. Oh, let's this see the sun. I have one sun. trick, Simon. It's the sun. That's the only trick I have. I don't have these, like, the languages and the flags. It's like, okay, the sun's in the south. Cool. So it's yeah. anywhere in half of the earth. Um, <laughs> if it was in the southern hemisphere, then, like, that would be more information because there's a lot less land. <laughs> oh, goodness me. no um, clue. Okay, I'm looking at the power line in the back. That does look a little bit like a... Um, when I've when I've had GeoGuessr in Japan before, they have quite unique like top sided power lines. But that that is like a real stab in the dark. Um, yeah, I think we have those. We have power lines like that. What about those? Um, the fact that you've got like the space saving holes drilled in the uh, streetlights there. Does yeah, that that's familiar? weird. No, 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 that's strange. Can that's we have not... a look at the vegetation? Maybe I'm wondering if. Sorry, I should close Twitch chat. Actually, I don't want to get. Distracted. Um, so it's deciduous. <laughs> That's very helpful. This tree. Oh, there's a car. There's a car. Wait. Uh, that might oh, be. There's the, there's the long lag. white. Long white plate. Long white plate. Oh, God. That could be European. Yeah, but it's not like the. There's places with long yellow plates, right? Yeah, but like they have a. There's like a blue bar on the left, which looks like an EU license plate. Um, this does look a bit like the UK, but like those power lines do look very different. There's a shed, and that is a very UK thing to have. Um, there's a goat. Or a, no, a that's sheep. a sheep. Oh come on, I meant. Oh, sheep. it's Wales. Uh, <laughs> it's Wales. <laughs> that's, no, I know no, sorry, animals. It's... Okay, I it's it's I meant sheep. All right, it's it's too sunny for Wales. Actually, it's too sunny um, for Wales. <laughs> Mm. Man, what are all the markings in the sky? Oh, those would be uh, air, uh, contrails. So it's probably over a major like flight route. Right, which that's means what I was that thinking. 
Europe is more likely than not, I guess. Which side of the road is that car parked on? It is parked on the right-hand side of the road. Yeah, but there's only one road. How does that work? But I mean, I feel like if you were driving on the left side of the road, you probably wouldn't park in that way if you were driving on the left. Like, you probably would have just gone nose first rather than, like, kind of shimmying in. Yeah, true. Um, man, I'm not this sure. is tough. It is. I'm fine with the UK. I'm fine with the UK state. I think these buildings... I, I don't, I, the, the buildings certainly look like the UK, but, like, it looks like they're driving on the right. That's a Volkswagen. Um, I, I don't know. What's that? Hang on, Does I'm waiting to catch familiar? it. Does that look familiar to you? Is that a Jessup's? Hang on, is that like a Jessup's bag? I'm getting out of my seat. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Um, I, I, <sighs> if you see something, say something. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean... This, yeah, time is so up. I think places. we have to right. pick one. I'm, uh, look, uh, there's a VW, German car. Let's say Germany. Germany? Okay. That, 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 that is a wild guess, but it it could be correct. I don't know. All right, let's go. Let's see. Oh, there's a delay. We've been watching the stream. Belgium. There's no oh! way. There's no We were close. Border country. Border country counts for something. We'll see. Border country counts for something. Okay. <laughs> All right, chat. It is your turn, chat. So here we go. Now what we're going to do is we'll open up Click Maps. Um, we'll get that ready. I will uh, play again. Uh, let me get my phone here for a timer. If I don't have a timer, it's just kind of like a mess for chat to keep up. So we're going to do... Let me get a timer. Yes, border right. country counts for zero. <laughs> it counts for something, and that thing is zero. <laughs> Not fair. Uh, oh, because I have it on the wrong thing. Let's go to stopwatch. There you go. All right, so uh, let me... We won't start click maps yet. So what we'll do is we'll bring that up. And then we'll have this here. Now you can, uh, what I'll do is I'll look around. If you see something that you want me to zoom in on, if you, uh, if there's anything like that, we'll look around. I kind of just sort of pick like spots that I think are important. So there's a basketball hoop, uh, playground that looks like it's in good condition, kind of. Um, there's a car, so we'll look, we'll zoom in. Uh, looks like long white plate without the. Is that right? Without the mm, blue stripe? Maybe? That's interesting. Um, I think I know where this is. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. How? Um, look at the trees. Look at the tre oh, where's the sun? The sun is. This is the south. sun cast, everyone. Is that south? I can't tell. Uh, no, it's north. Is that actually the, the brightest point? It looks like it. I can't really tell. It's very bright. Or is that the brightest point? It's kind of either way. Either way, it looks like the sun is in the northern hemisphere. Okay. So it looks a little bit south. <clears throat> yeah, Australia does has those, those plates, and of course, all of the signs are the wrong direction. <laughs> But yeah, so there you go. Okay, so, so time's that, up with that. that so yeah. now what we'll do is I'll open up, I'll start click maps and I open up the map. So here we go. Uh, I'll open up the map. So you have about one minute to click on the map where you would like to go. Wait, so can I be an agent click. of chaos here? Can I like yes, just, yeah, just, just screw with them? Go right to Antarctica, Simon. Um, so, well, so <laughs> Antarctica, boys, let's go. <laughs> so now, as you see, the people are clicking and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got so many media starts clicking on your face. I don't know why <laughs> they do that. In fact, I did this one time and they tried to click the uh, the X button like they wanted me to quit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so time we, to stop. <laughs> after a minute, we're going to go to the country with the highest percentage. So <laughs> look at these blobs. They're all over the place. So if you want your vote to count, click and click as much as you want, as often as you want. You have about 10 seconds left on this minute timer it looks like australia is going to be the uh or uh, the oceana uh territory is where we're going to be heading next uh looks at 64 63 percent 
Uh, okay, so time is up. So Oceana wins. So we're <laughs> look at that. Very divided. This hive mind is much yeah. more divided. Uh, all right, so we're going to zoom into. So what we'll do is we'll stop this. We will uh, close and restart. And then we'll zoom into the Oceana. And uh, you have about another 60 seconds. And then we will click on the country that has the most votes. Uh, so Simon and I got two. That was our country streak. Oh, so close. But they we were, even yeah, got they Bangladesh. Were difficult. They were difficult. They were, you, yeah. you, I mean, I carried us in spirit. <laughs> but you, but you no, know, you definitely helped. I, you know, I was, I was there, and I was excited, and that that <laughs> helped. Um, I don't, I don't know flags. Apparently, I'm finding out. Uh, so it looks like <laughs> looks like they're going to Australia. Looks like they're going to Australia. A couple seconds left. I don't think anybody's going off that eighty six percent. So uh, we're gonna go with Australia. Uh, let's see. Final answer: Australia. I love Coopsy's First solution of down. middle mouse wheel scroll is the click and just hit it with compressed air. That's brilliant. <laughs> I was wondering how ten people did eighteen thousand clicks. No. Uh. So let's see. Let's go to the next round. Um. <clears throat> Is that done? I, yeah, hope, I hope you guys get Belgium. It's what you people deserve. <laughs> Come on, we want them to lose this one. Otherwise, it's a there tie at go. best So for here's us. your next... Oh, I was hoping that that was black. Uh, that's a bummer. Uh, uh, okay, so they have an actual... Uh, <laughs> there good luck, chat! Nothing here. <laughs> well, you got a two-lane road. Uh, it almost looks like the States. Except I don't know those things. Those things... These things are <laughs> Chat, you know. Oh, come on. <laughs> France, I guess Earth. Oh, good, good guess, good guess. So the sun Brazil. is... Where's the sun, you think? I think it's that direction. The sun is in the southern hemisphere, so we're probably in the north. <clears throat> those are... Oh, God, are those stratocumulus clouds, I think? So strato stratocumulus clouds, chat, so that will help. Um, I th I, I what think. place on the earth makes stratocumulus clouds? I've got bad news. Show them something <laughs> wrong. Oh, those only those only show up in uh, and above in Antarctica. Italy. Italy. <laughs> Antarctica. <laughs> it's like there's no snow. Simon. There's no it's snow. a very specific uh, cloud that's unique to uh, Ohio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Can, Can we, we look, look down, down at the camera? the camera? Yes. There we are. This is down. Um, go That's away. That's asphalt. It is. Oh, time's up. Hold on. We gotta go to the go to the vote. We gotta go to the vote. Uh, wow, that so was a quick recently, minute. It was. Well, that was even almost a minute and a half. Okay, here we go. Uh, so oh, it started. Okay, good. So give us a country or give us a, a continent. We'll say give us the continent. Uh, in the next minute. Um, remember, you, this is all about who can click that fastest. So if you guys want your vote to count click uh right now there's 12 people and 60 clicks so keep going um simon is of course clicking on something where he wants you to go um yeah look at I think, I think you're disrupting the, <laughs> i think you're disrupting the blob simon uh <laughs> we can see the quality of the car camera and its distance from the road which indicates ver ver version oh yeah good point oh they're divided oh, oh. wow wow it's all over the map, um, literally. So there's 30 people and 360 clicks. Uh, let's see where it goes in the next few seconds. Did it stop? Did it break? Oh, no. There it goes. It's still oh, going. wow. Okay. People are not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I there's nearly 500 clicks with 30 people. So it's, you know, <clears throat> this is this is a, 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 a game of who can click faster <laughs> and it looks like we're going to south america so let's zoom into south america all right i think so th that is probably where my guess would be now but yeah. now it's going to be like now the hive mind is going to fall apart because you know it's going to go from 30 33 people down to just a couple people who you know voted for where they want so here we go let's zoom in so now again oh. after a minute uh we will pick the country or pick the country that falls into the center of the blob so Make sure that your blobs are where you want them. And that might mean you have to click away from the blob to get it to go to the part that you want to. It's really a hive mind game. Yeah. I can't wait for them to be like politically liberal parties and just like factionalize massively. They're going to start self-sabotaging. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. 
I like that you're getting clicked on and not me this time. Yeah. Thank it's, you for the every every click on me makes everybody else less powerful. <laughs> actually more powerful. If there are fewer people clicking, then yeah, it's uh you're actually making the people in the majority more powerful. Okay, so it looks like the the blob is on is that Brazil, Brazil or is it Paraguay? I think that's on Brazil. I think it's on Brazil. This is the this is the center right here. Yeah, I think Brazil is the uh Brazil is the center, and uh, time is just about up. You have a few seconds left. <laughs> Some people clicking on Ghana, which might be right, <laughs> for all I know. All right, there it is. I, I guess we're going with Brazil. So here we go. Final answer. Does, do, does Twitch chat at least tie with us? Oh, wow. Thailand. Whoa. Nobody Way said that. Off. Way That off. means you win. We did win. I I won. I want to say I did it. I yeah. did everything. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't even know how you knew the lang you knew the language. You knew the flags. I I oh man. <laughs> I was just like Simon will probably be pretty good at GeoGuessr. And I, I was that was an understatement to say the least. Holy smokes! What well, we did win, Simon. Congratulations. We did. Well, you, you've won a, ch a challenge versus chat. I know. We did. We deserve that. We deserve. Oh, it. Yeah. We did a good job. Um. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for playing Twitch chat and Simon. Thank you so much. I might um, have to steal that because that was really fun. <laughs> yeah, we do that a lot. We do that with Archive or Snarkive. Have you ever heard of that? No. It's a computer generated game. Or it's a computer generated. Here, I'll show it real quick for chat's sake. Um, Archive versus Snarkive. Now, what happens is we'll start up. Okay. We'll start up click maps. I'll start it up really quickly and we'll just play one round all together. So it's on. And what you do is one of these is a real title on archive and one of these oh. is computer generated. So then, <laughs> so click maps is on everybody. So vote for the one that you think is the real, real uh, paper and which one's the fake one. And then we'll do this one. I played this one with uh, Astrono Misfit. It was so much fun. Um, oh, and, that's amazing. Yeah. And this one sounds good to me. So that was right. So that's what you do. I, I should have waited for everybody. I forgot if you click on it that it actually takes it. But yeah, and it looks like 15 people clicked that way. So that was the more obvious one. But like, so that's <laughs> a lot of fun. And we do Connect Four is another one we like to play. And uh, we even did Where's Waldo for a little while, which was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Let me get rid of this. <laughs> but yeah, so 100%. Anyways, our, our time is has run out. Thank you so much, Simon. This was an absolute blast. Oh, no. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. <laughs> Uh, I, I really appreciate that. Um, remember everybody, we will be back Friday for a, uh, I won't, I probably won't be rating anybody cause I usually don't rate anyone when I have a, a guest cause I, I want, you know, to, to, to just end so I can end and not, and I want to end right in the middle of when I raid someone and be like, <laughs> not respond. So, uh, so we won't be rating anybody, but anyways, thank you so much, Simon. I appreciate it. Thank you. Twitch chat for everything. I know I missed a lot of follows. There was a lot of follows and a lot of, and, uh, and there was some subs. So thank you so much for all of that. Uh, Sunday we, or Friday, we'll be back with a study stream. Sunday, we'll be back with a stream, hopefully building if I'm feeling well enough. And then, uh, Remember, two weeks from today, we have another guest on the stream. So join the Discord for more announcements about that. Simon, is there anything you'd like to say before we go? Oh, man. Um, I apologize to the nation of Belgium. Uh, <laughs> I apologize that I mistook you for your older, larger, cooler cousin. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was this was a ton of fun. It was really great to just kind of hang in with you and play some uh, to, and beat chat just to beat chat we did. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that bit we and did, also yeah if you want to if you thought i was interesting and possibly entertaining and you haven't already you can pre-order my book um if you go on my YouTube channel youtube channel you can see a video all about it thank uh, you yeah, Swear Dark, to remind me <laughs> nc has the uh he just posted the simon uh command in chat so make sure you go and uh follow simon on all his socials as well if you don't which would be I mean, that'd be weird, champ, right? <laughs> um, but anyways, thank you so much, everybody. I will be back on Friday. I will see you then. Take care, everybody. Uh, thanks again, and adios. Bye.